Larson, how you doing? This is Ed Larson from the Round Table of Gentlemen. How you doing, baby? I miss you too, but you don't gotta miss me too much because I got another show with Miss Amber Nelson called The Brighter Side. It's a cynic's look at optimism. And we all need positivity in our life because if you're all negative, it's gonna globity gloop in your stomach and you're gonna be a miserable, nasty person. Nobody wants to be with the miserable nasties. Boo. They're bad. Just keep them away from everyone else. Back, back, back. On our show, on a regular basis, we have this thing called, it's a game we invented. It's called hoop a goo goo noo noo doo doo How would you say it? hoop a goo doo 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 There is no way to say it. It's a game we made up, and basically it's a rapid-fire edition of finding the positivity in something negative. We're going to play a quick version for you right now so you see how it goes. Amber, could you give me something negative? Something negative. Horse manure. Horse manure. All right. You could throw it at a car. I mean, you shouldn't be throwing horse manure at cars. It's a bad thing to do, but... Probably fun to watch. Heck yeah, and they got it coming for them, being a car and all. <laughs> What's your positive of horse manure? Um, you can use it to feed plants that make the food. That's right. That's right. Manure makes food. Isn't that great? That poo poo makes food for more poo poo. Oh, that's so nice. It's a circle of poo poo. I want to say, Amber, what is the brighter side of dirty blankets? Dirty blankets. Uh, you can put in a barn and keep a dog warm. You're such a nice person. I uh, I'm gonna say I like doing laundry. I'm gonna clean the blanket. Oh, you like doing laundry? I enjoy laundry. It zens me out. It makes me peaceful. Fold it nice. Put it in the cabinet. You got a clean blanket for when guests come over or. When it gets chilly. What I'm trying to say is, listen to the brighter side. It's a cynic's look at optimism, and it's on the last podcast network. And also, clean your sheets at least two weeks, because you need to sleep in a clean blanket. Be good to yourself, baby. There's no place to escape to. This is the last podcast. On the left. (laughs) That's when the cannibalism started. What was that? Well, honestly, it's been a very tough week oh, yeah. here for LPN. We've been dealing with quite a lot of emotional stuff. Uh huh. Um, quite a bit. Obviously, you've heard, you know, with the recent passing of Bird Luger and what we've been trying to do and staying on topic. You know, we're in the middle of doing this this series about Dr. Mengele, and but there was like a little German proverb that I had read Uh-oh. that kind of that started like give me enough inspiration to like get my head. Back in the game, so this my is, nose to the this, this is going to honor Kevin Barnett. It was just this little thing, and I and I was like, something rings true about it. It was uh-huh. this German saying I read that said, "Work sets you free." <laughs> oh, is that and right? I, was I like, don't know. So that's sort of like the Notre Dame, what's above their locker room, where it's like play like a champion today. <laughs> it's just that statement. I keep saying it back, set back to myself, saying, "You're right. <laughs> yeah. You're right. <laughs> Work right. can really make you feel better sometimes." So that's what it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, oh my god. <laughs> that was the point of that disgusting <laughs> message. All right, everyone, this is the last podcast on the left. I am Ben Kissel. Marcus Parks is with me. How's your brain, Marcus? It's all right, man. How about you? Doing just fine. Marcus and I had a great opportunity uh, to go honor Kevin Barnett this past Friday at the Bell House. want to thank the Lucas Bros for putting that whole thing together. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful seeing the fans out. And in uh, Los Angeles, there is also going to be a tribute show to KB. Uh, We don't have the exact date yet, but we will make sure to let you know. And uh, hopefully we can try to get out there and participate in that as well. And of course, we also have Henry and Zabrowski. Yes, uh, I am just so grateful that, like, honestly, there is the one thing that it does put a lens on is that as much pain as you're going through, uh, every single time I was like going through my tabs to get back to work, because now we've been sitting with Dr. Mangala for uh, om- close to a month. And so there's a point where it's like I have a series of tabs open on my computer. And as I was like going through my day these last couple of days, every once in a while I'd click the tab because I would just open up images of Auschwitz to look at. So I could like have more visual references of it. And man, it is worse than a cup of coffee. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Like it's just it's just the I don't know what the opposite, I don't know what the soul drenching version of a cup of coffee mm-hmm. is, uh-huh. but it is that. But at least it puts it to a positive perspective is that I'm not in Auschwitz right now. If you watch the docs, there's some there's some controversy, I have to say, over the name. 
Joseph Mangala. Uh-huh. I watched one. They called him Mangali, which just <laughs> sounds like too much fun. Like Mangali sounds like happens. someone who could tap, uh, you know, and would do like fun performances <laughs> with a cane. Mangali. I'm Mangali. Yeah, like right. a horrible tickety, tickety, tickety. magician. Um, I just don't like that one. But this is the consequences, Kissel, of when you actually research something and you start to see that kind of shit where it's like you're reading about something for hours and you hear experts all have to change the pronunciation just so that they make sure they sound as smart right. as possible. Mm-hmm. I do believe that's how it is. They'll say, Yosef Mengele, in order for you to like feel like, well, he must really know how to pronounce right. it. Like, he must have really done the reading. Yeah, it's like Mengele sounds like a fun vaudeville performer and Mengele sounds like a freedom fighter. It's Mengele. <laughs> it's Mengele. That's it. Mengele sounds the most evil. Mengele is who we're going with today. Absolutely, because of course he is the most evil. So we are on uh, to the crimes of Joseph Mengele, and there are many. Uh, episode part two. Now, I think it goes without saying that this is going to be one of our most brutal, gut-wrenching episodes ever. Truly the shiniest of gold stars. So, in an attempt to try to lighten it up even the tiniest bit, after certain particularly horrible bits of information, we're going to be providing did-you-know facts about 90s sitcom Home Improvement. Okay. See, it's important for you to remember how much lore that is in Home Improvement. <laughs> yeah. There is a There's lot. a lot of side quests. There's a lot of with the whole bibliography that goes with home improvement is very impressive. Absolutely. The show within the show, tool time. I'm sure we'll get some facts on that. <laughs> and of course they were representative of the modern American family with the goth kid. Yeah. When the kid turned goth, he was so fun. I will oh, I will say also about this episode, I don't know if this is like a crack a beer episode. Ooh. I don't know if this is uh. a fucking Skittles. I finally got some Skittles from the Dookie Brothers, which I've been talking about quite a bit. Oh, and I don't know if it's that kind of shit. I don't. I don't know if it, if blazing yourself into a stupor is going to help. But I think this is really important to really because <clears throat> we're handling Doctor Mengele like he's a fucking serial killer because he is. Right. So we're now going through the weapons and his crimes as detailed as possible as we would with any other serial killer. Yes, and of course, uh, there's a lot of information on Auschwitz out there. We're not going to do a, a total cover. No. of Auschwitz. No. Material. We're going to have a lot of information that's new to all of us. Specifically, it was really new to me. Uh, so, um, But if you want more information, you can find it. You know that. Before we dive in, that's a part of it, is that as a true crime, as a true, true crime nerd as well inside of me, Auschwitz and the world of the Nazis, and Dr. Mengele in particular, involves this gigantic world of a rogues gallery of the worst villains to ever exist. Mm. Because Dr. Mengele is our spotlight, but all around him, the entire world of it is, is deeper and deeper and deeper, and there's so many concepts. Mm-hmm. So at some point, you're, I'm like, you know, seven days in to Auschwitz, like we're eating all this stuff, and I'm like, I'm not even scratching the surface. So you guys, if you want a full deep dive into just Auschwitz, there's many, there's many places to get that information. Right. So without further ado, let's get into the crimes of Dr. Joseph Mengele at Auschwitz. Now, one of the most important things to remember in this episode is that the Nazis, by this point, had not only taken over Germany's government and military, but damn near every inch of academia as well, from universities to hospitals. By the time they were finally brought down, the Nazis had established 33 university and research institutions, 18 university professorships, and four research divisions dedicated to, quote-unquote, racial hygiene within the Reich Health Office. Hmm. Now, although this doesn't sound all that important when you compare it to, say, like a parliamentary body or an air force, what this meant was that the medical and scientific research community now had all the ethics and reasoning of a Nazi, which is to say... None at all. Hmm. When you mention the words parliamentary body, I just pictured like a really naked Taft, <laughs> just like a president Taft. Me. Just the, what, what does that look like? I have a parliamentary body. <laughs> if you look at me, yeah, it's called sporadically covered with hair, and it's a Polish level of soft, but still hard in some places. Of course, that's when you have to go to the doctor. <laughs> These people felt not only invincible, but godlike. These were the men who believed they were having a hand in creating the master race, humanity's future. And nobody rode this wave harder than Dr. Joseph Mengele. He loved it. He loved it. It was like he was born at the perfect time for himself, and Mm. he knew it. He was, like, kind of came into himself in this time period. It's also very interesting to see how far they went to validate 
their own existence as a party in terms of the Nazis. That's why this ends up becoming insidiously the most powerful, besides just the actual war engine of the Nazis, It is this other idea of we are going to take and manipulate races until everybody looks just like us. We are going to eliminate everybody else using the uh, what's supposed to be the uh, the nice and the professional visage of the doctor, uh, which is that's what they all did. But then it's also interesting that after the fact, that was the first evidence to go. All that shit got flushed down the toilet, even though they spent all the time and money trying to validate their stupid fucking shit fuck existence. Well, it also just takes a total lack of like reality and a complete lack of like understanding even how goofy and weird your your own culture is mm-hmm. you imagine they're talking about the master race and then all of a sudden someone sp- spits a pickle out of their mouth that they, w- they were having with a liverwurst sandwich <laughs> somebody you know breaks wind in the corner the whole room just smells like a disgusting cigar factory have you ever worn real later hosen oh yeah buddy my mom of they're- course my father my parents were, i mean they guaranteed embarrassment i was in sick when i was six years old my whole family wore later hosen and my mom thought it was going to make us the coolest kids in kindergarten and it yeah. did not work believe it or not <laughs> sounds like it just runs in the, the long line of her people just holding to the line no matter what no matter what anybody <laughs> says good but, lord but when it comes to later hosen they're incredibly uncomfortable like, <laughs> they're just sweat bags no they're just made to give you a camel toe <laughs> oh, and then somehow they've tried this is the amazing marketing of the german people they've tried to make it sexy Ugh. i know what's going on saint Pauli girl <laughs> nothing sexy about what's happening under that sweat box So, when we last left Mengele, the year was 1943, World War II was in full swing, and a post had just opened up for an SS doctor in what would soon be known as the worst place in human history, Mm. Auschwitz. And Mengele had no qualms whatsoever about using the people imprisoned there to further his and Dr. Ottmar Freiherr von Verschur's research into the medical phenomenon of twins. Mm. As we said last time, Mengele's original interest in twins was inspired by the work already being done at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology, Human Hereditary, and Eugenics. Again, you give it a fancy name and it sounds legit, but it's actually total horseshit, Dr. Frankenstein-like science. Right. Yeah, and seeing if they could unlock the breeding secrets of twins in order to double the master race with each pregnancy was only a part of it. In, so they wanted twins. So yes. twins were seen as like really special. Yeah, you could, but you could double the master race. You double your money. That's but the idea. you can also just have more than one kid. <laughs> you don't have to do it all in one no, go. But then you don't have to wait nine months for another one. That's that, the uh, idea. Is that you're getting everybody to have twins. So everybody is a double mint commercial from hell. Right. Where you're, you're spurting these picture perfect copies of their Aryan parents out everywhere and they thought that we could literally just sew parts together until we make them by hand. Now these guys, they also believe that studying twins would unlock certain hereditary secrets as well. Because after all, if you had identical twins, then you had a de facto control group for comparison in whatever it was that you happened to be studying. Mm. But since the war had broken out, finding identical twins was pretty low on the priority list. So for these scientists, the concentration camps were literally millions of people were being held against their will with no hope of escape. These camps were a boon beyond these guys' wildest dreams because it wasn't just that they were captive. Because when it came to certain segments of the European population, particularly the Jewish and Romani people, there were no boundaries whatsoever on what was allowed to be done, Mm. even if it meant killing them in the process. In fact, when it came to most of Mengele's experiments, the killing was essential. And Mengele did it with no compunction whatsoever. Because his belief was that there were two gifted races in the world, Germans and Jews. And so, once the Jews were completely and totally annihilated, the Germans would be on top, and the rest of the world would eventually just capitulate to the will of the German people. And grow to love pickles. But (laughs) when it it came to Mengele, too, that that motivation was not found out until his diaries were looked over after the fact. Because until then, he followed the line of the idea... That they well, eventually, when we will get to Auschwitz, have they called them numbers? And the the they were inhuman. And the the outer motive was that these people are already dead, so I am doing nothing to dead people. But secretly, 
he had this side motive saying that he felt that they were equal. And so it was almost like he was punishing them to make sure that they got beaten so that only the Germans would survive. So it comes to mm. this other, like, in the end, if we're looking at him like a serial killer, his missionary style killings in the, in the, what would happen later on uh, at the camp are fueled by actually pure black hatred oh absolutely that's a really fascinating uh point though that i didn't quite realize how they actually thought of them as um as true competition to take over the world yeah and that's why uh this escalated and got so unbelievably aggressive and, and hate-filled well the thing is about mengele is that the destruction of the jewish race wasn't mengele's only driving force for him this was also a game of ambition as mengele wanted nothing more than to be a professor. Oof. But in order to do that, you gotta have field work and you gotta get experience. There is nothing worse than a man failing at his dream. <laughs> and if you want, like the old adage of like, if you can't do, teach, but he can't teach, so what does he do? I mean, how, like, that is so sad. I, I mean, look at us on the lowest level possible, what we covered last series with Mark Twitchell, yeah. where it's the same thing, where a guy that was no good at being a filmmaker became a serial killer because right. essentially it was easier. Mengele, we're going to find out too, is that during his time period when he was writing his student papers, they all say his work was like pretty average. It's okay, like it, like it was okay. Like he did, he did his perfunctory shit. But what he w knew is that he needed to get involved in a hot project. Like he needed to go get involved in the good place version of uh, what the Nazis can put out. Right, like you got to be in that writer's room in order to get Emmys. So he knows that he had to be put himself in the, the middle of the heat of the most what they at the time were like the most buzzworthy experiments so that it would get the attention of the philosophical leaders of the Nazi party mainly Himmler where it's like all of this shit was to appease him because he knew that if Himmler gave him the tip of the cap Mengele would be set for shit because he actually was a terrible student so we have a failed artist in Hitler we have a failed professor in Mengele I don't understand how they spun that and being like we must be superior <laughs> it is obvious that you it's are not obvious well it's obvious how they spun it to we must be superior because because every day they woke up knowing that they were a fucking fraud. And instead of spending right. your life trying to then make your life work in another constructive way or maybe saying like, hey, fuck these Nazis, um, you just kind of like followed suit to whatever worked towards your advantage. Mediocrity mm -hmm. ro rose to the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Mangala, since he needed to do field work, he chose to do his field work at Auschwitz. Mm. But even just that decision says a lot about Joseph Mengele. The naked cruelty and the psychological games that he would play with both the prisoners and his staff of Jewish slave doctors suggests a mind far beyond that of just an ambitious professor. In fact, many times, the victims of Mengele's experiments and the victims of his straight-up murders, as there were quite a few of both, these victims were all known to Mengele. Because the vast majority of Mengele's victims were children. Mm. And Mengele would routinely make friends with them prior to experiments, even going so far as to bring them gifts. He was even beloved amongst some of them for a time. He even had nicknames. They called him Uncle Mengele, Uncle Doctor, and Uncle Peppy. Oh, oh God. And it, it was, but it's eerily similar to the actual plot of the day the clown cried right the failed jerry lewis nazi uh nazi clown movie because i started going to a deep dive of trying to find evidence of more nazi clowns and if that was that true or not or or you know clowns are in the holocaust but this movie sounds fucking brutal <laughs> the whole thing is about him like as a clown and then he volunteers to entertain the children all the way to the get to the gas chambers and do all this kind of shit but technically that's what Mengele was doing. Yeah, that is really disturbing. And of course, you can watch a little bit, uh, a bit of that Jerry Lewis film. It's on YouTube. It's not, I don't even know. It's not even a full 30 minutes because it looks like they kind of broke it up with a, with a, uh, with a person sort of hosting it. But yeah, humor at the Holocaust is a very interesting, uh, phenomenon that you mm -hmm. can do some research on yourself. It's fascinating. Well, these children, no matter how fond they thought that Mengele was of them, they would all eventually see the Mengele that went down in history as one of the most inhuman figures mm. to ever live. So by the time Mengele arrived in Auschwitz in May of 1943, the concentration camp already held 140,000 prisoners. 
Originally built in 1940 to hold Polish political prisoners, the function changed in April of 1942 when Jewish people began arriving by the thousands. Henry, you are allowed to you are allowed to scream about Polish victimhood at this time. You have you have thirty seconds to scream about how the Polish people were brutally. My people are strong, and we are out there serving vengeance to everyone else every day by slowly but in, in slowly but surely introducing Guy Fieri to Liverworth, which I've seen now in several episodes, letting it seep into the rest of society. But also Auschwitz was built in a fucking no man's land. It was built in a part of Poland that no one would go live in because in the summers it was brutally fucking hot and in the winters it was brutally fucking cold. It was essentially the closest you get to a Polish desert, which is, in my mind, a Polish desert would be like you show up and you think you're, you're going to see a lot of sand, but actually it's a lot of cakes. But that's a whole fucking... <laughs> that sounds like a fun desert. Mm-hmm. Now, the first thing you got to know about Auschwitz is how mind-bogglingly large it really was. It was actually a camp complex comprised of prison blocks, warehouses, workshops, barracks, factories, and, quote-unquote, medical facilities. Mm. The entire thing was actually split into three sections. There was Konzentrationslager Auschwitz I, or KZ Auschwitz I, as the Germans abbreviated it, that was the main prison camp. 28 prisoner blocks held about 1,200 people in each block, and barracks meant for no more than 700. But in 1942, Auschwitz was expanded twice to accommodate new functions. There was KZ Auschwitz III Monowitz, which was located about four miles away from the main camp and was responsible for much of the slave labor produced by the prisoners. But where we'll be spending most of our time today is KZ Auschwitz II, Birkenau. Now, while Monowitz and Auschwitz I certainly held their own special hells, Birkenau was truly the world center of misery and death in a time when misery and death reigned supreme. Ooh, so you got basically we'll, we'll call number one Captain Spaulding's gas station from House <laughs> yeah. of a Thousand Corpses. Number three, that'll be the house where the Firefly family lit uh -huh. fire. Uh, Firefly family lived, and then Dr. Satan is uh, in number two. Pretty much, yeah. I think that it's, when we talk about this too, like when we've talked a lot of, when we've talked about other heavy hitters in the past and other serial killers in the past, we kind of talk about their locations and how it is, how they would build their own worlds to accommodate their crimes, to both either hide them or validate them, or like we see like inner and outer worlds, like where Jerry Brudos, where it's like he had his main house, but then he had his shed where he did mm. all his shit. Or like Ed Gein, where he had his whole house, which was a land of horrors, except for the one room that he kept sacred, right? Because the idea of like exteriorizing psychology in a way for them to build their own little fantasy worlds imagine it's this is just a government of serial killers built a house of killing and so you go you basically mengala volunteered to work in hell uh in order to be on top of hell right but achieving such heights of cruelty was not a simple thing so in order to make it happen this entire thing needed an infrastructure that meant that auschwitz actually functioned as a small town it had a grocery store, a cinema, a theater, a swimming pool, and a symphony orchestra. That it is great. So there were like actors, like community theater actors, like just getting ready for their big performance of the Nutcracker at some point. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. It is so, like someone's just, you just imagine going to the supermarket, someone's just smelling the cantaloupe, be like, yeah. no, is it fresh or not? Who gives a shit? You're in Auschwitz. What are you doing? Get out of here. It, but that was really shocking to me. I didn't realize it was a full functioning town mm -hmm. in hell, as, as Henry uh, alluded to. Yeah. Yeah, it even had a functioning brothel called The Puff, which was <sighs> used as a quote-unquote reward for non-Jewish prisoners who worked hard enough. In fact, The Puff was the first, and I didn't know this, this is insane, The Puff was the first building on the left Right after you walked through the infamous Arbeit macht frei entrance in Block oh. 24, which personally gave that sign an entirely new horrible context. 
Well, they also put the sign up there, and the concept of work sets you free was a uh, thing, it was a lie they told, partially believing that, saying saying to people, well, you'll actually work your sentence off here. Um, And then eventually, Hulse, that was the uh, in charge of Auschwitz, would say, well, it actually was more of a philosophical statement. Right, Mm -hmm. a.k.a. a lie. Yeah. A lie. (laughs) The thing was, for prisoners, the puff was just another form of punishment. All the prisoners wanted was more bread, more rest, more water. But instead, the Nazis just announced in front of everyone who was going to be rewarded with the brothel that night. And most times, the whole thing, it was just a humiliating experience because the workers were just too tired and miserable to do anything. And furthermore, the women working in the brothel, they were prisoners, too. They were also there against the will. They were all German and Polish uh, political prisoners. It sounds like, uh, what's the name of the big, fat, green bastard from Star Wars? Oh, Jabba the Hutt? Jabba Jabba the Hutt. Hutt. It is very (laughs) similar. uh, It is so disgusting to bring that. And just for the Germans to think that, do they... They, they did not think they were doing something nice here, right? They, they did. No, they, the sick, they, dark abso- joke no, they that this ab- was. They absolutely thought they were doing something. They nice. thought they were going to do yeah. something nice here. Yes, they, they that's could how perverted not they were at this point. Kissel, I'm sorry about this. You, I mean, you know, this is how it is. They literally could not be more evil if they tried. Yeah, they want. They wanted it all to be. Conversely. The, the rewards are also punishments. Every day is reflective on you are in this upside down world where it, everybody's time is limited. You are an expendable person. We are even doing this for our own little fucking bullshit fantasy world where we are now in charge and we get to the thrill of telling you you're allowed to have sex now. Mm-hmm. Disgusting. There is no point at which the Nazis fail to be the bad guy. They right. yeah. always, always succeed. Yeah, I mean, to make it even worse, like, you'd think, like, even, okay, maybe maybe they could commiserate. They're both prisoners. Maybe they could talk to each other. Uh, nope, because there was always an SS officer watching everything in the puff through a peephole to make sure that nobody did anything except the missionary position. Oh, my. This is extremely German. Yeah. That's how I will <laughs> clarify that and classify that. And some of the Nazis at Auschwitz, they took the amenities even further. The camp commandant, Rudolf Hess raised his five children with his wife in a white stucco house complete with a white picket fence and a garden tended by slaves just a couple hundred yards from a prison block. Yeah, in the book, uh, Mengele, a complete story, talks about how like they would have little pets and lizards and the family, the kids would go out there and they'd be playing in the yard. Meanwhile, they were with the the uh, the Jewish prisoners that were forced to work for them, and mm. they would like Jewish prisoners would gain. Uh, they had like relations with their children and stuff like that, and then like you'd literally have like Father Hess come out and be like, "No, no, do not get close to the gardener because the gardener will be gone tomorrow." And they would all be like, "Yeah, da- oh, good, Daddy." It's fucking awful shit. Right, mm-hmm. absolutely disgusting. Yeah, Auschwitz was so big that it had stoplights traffic regulations and an ss run traffic court you could get a traffic ticket in auschwitz and have to go to court for it of course though i mean so literally you i would just say judge i understand i might have been speeding but there are some bigger problems here (laughs) sir and i do not think i deserve to pay this fine Robinhood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos all commission-free. They strive to make financial services work for everyone, not just the wealthy. It's a non-intimidating way for stock market newcomers to invest for the first time with true confidence. Robinhood is simple and intuitive, clear design with data presented in an easy-to-digest way. Other brokerages charge up to $10 for every trade, but Robinhood doesn't charge commission freeze. Trade stocks and keep all of your profits. Learn how to invest as you build your portfolio. Discover new stocks and track favorite companies with personalized news feed and there's custom notifications for price movements so you never miss the right moment to invest i'm a stock market newcomer and i love robin hood their custom notifications are perfect for my lifestyle and robin hood has made it easy for me to learn about investing robin hood is giving listeners a free stock like apple ford or sprint to help build your portfolio sign up at lastpod.robinhood.com again that's lastpod.robinhood.com
Now, as we said last time, when Mengele arrived in Auschwitz, he was already somewhat of a man apart because he was one of the few stationed there who had seen combat in the Eastern Front. In fact, many of the SS men at Auschwitz were in the camp specifically so they could avoid going to the Eastern Front, where there was a damn good chance of getting your head blown off by a Russian if you didn't die of hypothermia first. Mm. Now, this cowardice was actually one of the main threats that kept mouths shut in the camp. Because if you didn't like what was going on around you, it was always Stalingrad in December. Mm. Now, Mengele further distinguished himself almost immediately by the way he handled a typhoid epidemic that was working its way through the Romani camp when he arrived. See, typhus is a disease that thrives in overcrowded, unsanitary environments. And since there was no place in the world more overcrowded and unsanitary than Auschwitz, typhoid epidemics were a constant problem. Do yourself a favor and don't look up victims of typhus, yeah. which is a thing that I did to try to understand exactly what it was. And it's just a, it's horrible. It's just the worst disease. It's just a fucking terrible disease. Mm. And you're also all on top of each other. Right. But Mengele, he hit the streets of Auschwitz without winking his eye like Caroline in the city and he knew I'm I can handle this I'm ready to go like he was fucking he jumped right into trying to handle the problem to handle the problem and these people were still forced to work uh, well extremely sick I have to say I if I get a if I have a, a sneeze <laughs> on a Monday I'm not working until Wednesday I, no, I we can't know. do anything it is, we've dealt with this before yes. we know we know that your institution is fragile we just try we just try to get all those golden words out of you as quickly as possible <laughs> between your bouts of sickness well since there was no place in the world more overcrowded and unsanitary than Auschwitz, typhoid ec epidemics were a constant problem. And upon arrival, Mengele had been put in charge of an entire block of prisoners that was going through a typhoid epidemic. So Mengele dealt with his first typhoid epidemic by ordering the execution of anyone even suspected of having typhus. Uh. In all, that order resulted in the deaths of 600 people. And that was among the first things that Mengele did when he arrived. There was no slow burn, no progression. It was just, boom, 600 dead immediately. So because he was dead on the inside, and he knew that he had to make a good impression on his superiors, he looked at the stuff, because before there were the, the people, because, you know, Mengele had bosses, too. You know, he had uh, his boss, uh, Edward Wirths, that was the, uh, the technically the head doctor of Auschwitz, and then Hulse, that was the ones above him. And they were kind of like wringing their hands about what to do about this thing. And Mengele's just like, oh, we kills them all. And they're all like, this is the kind of breath of fresh air we need here. <laughs> right, it's rewarding. They rewarded him for this horrible act. They rewarded him constantly for everything that he did there. And the homicidal pragmatism when it came to dealing with the prisoners went far beyond just that one incident. Near the end of 1944, a food shortage in the Romani women's camp resulted in one of Mengele's most terrifying acts of cruelty. So when this food shortage came, an order came down from Berlin that because there was not enough food to sustain the population in this particular camp, the camp should be immediately, in the words of the Nazis, liquidated. Yep. Now, Mengele, he fought against the order, but not because he thought it was morally wrong. His only concern was that he and the other Nazi doctors were losing a valuable crop of experimentees. That is, any single time anybody wants to say, because now also you read the uh revisionist here oh, yeah. the, the revisionist history of Mengele and all this kind of shit and they all want to say but no you see look he showed compassion no he was trying to quote unquote save people he turns up they're like no 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 he knew he had a bottom line and his bottom line was that if these if he doesn't have these bodies he can't do the experimentations that are going to get him the shit that he needs after all of this is over right because he's just viewing after the war he's like oh this is just a fucking chapter in my life after this i'm gonna be fucking i'll be a doctor i got my perfect blonde wife i'll be pumping twins and out of her because by then i'll be crushing the fucking twin press and you're like this this is the i mean obviously the most evil part about the nazis is that all this shit was done with a form and you just sign your signature and then everybody's fucking then that's 600 people gone and you know it's really another example or a more primitive example of the monetization of humans uh, of human suffering and mm -hmm. human beings in general obviously now we do it with data mining we are we are the product that kind of keeps the internet going mm -hmm. um but that is yeah so that because i have heard that revisionist history and when we talk about all of these things like the puff and stuff like that or the 
poof, all these things. We're not even coming close to entertaining the idea that this was somehow a joyous situation. No, no it's because- just trying to explain that this is this this is like what they built a whole world so they could do this shit in private. Yeah, and they, I think they, that's they fascinating. Went and- they carved out a, a place in a desperate in a desperate section of the world in order to make sure no eyeballs could see what they did because it, for them they said it was this proud thing and they were feeding Mengele this line of bullshit of being like no 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 this is the real meaning of the season this is why we need you you're the one that's going to validate the existence of the Nazis but instead what they did was they they also it was a trick on Mengele too because they're like we can then just wipe it away clean and w- once it's all done so because once they come to fucking hang us we can get rid of as much fucking evidence as possible and it, it's but something about it but being like this like deadwood like town it's just it's just mind-boggling yeah well the thing is about mangala when this order came down even though he was against it mangala above all else was still a good little nazi right so he carried it out with such a vicious glee that one survivor said that after that day whenever he sees a picture of dracula he thinks of Joseph Mengele. They look similar. They actually they do. very yeah. much do. But I wonder if that's on purpose or if that's just a, uh, a coincidence. Dracula came uh, long before World War II. Okay, so yeah. maybe Mengele was going for the Dracula <laughs> look. I see. <laughs> he, was go- he was trying to be Dracula. He was appropriating Dracula's culture. <laughs> well, as mothers were being loaded into trucks for transport to the gas chambers, the children hid. So Mengele, since he had a relationship with the children personally combed the blocks looking for them rooting them out of hiding spots then once he found them he drove them to the gas chamber in his own car and when one child pleaded with uncle mangala not to be sent away he gave a casual wave of his hand without even looking at her to signal a nazi capo to deal with it and so the capo grabbed the little girl and flung her against the wheel of a transport truck so hard that her skull shattered. Over 10 days, 40,000 people were loaded into those same trucks and taken to the gas chambers, either screaming in fear or merely sitting in terrified silence. All right. Well, that is uh, extremely dis- disturbing. Didn't you guys say we we're going to have like a home improvement break? Because I could go for one of those right now after that absolutely horrific story. Al Borland's name was originally going to be Glenn. And that's oh. a terrible th- name. That's a terrible <laughs> okay. thing. Oh, my God. All right. Uh, that, that does. No, that does actually ease it a little bit. Um, wow. Oh, so this yeah. is. It, kind of take, takes the weight off the chest a little bit. A little oh, bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just so makes, devastating. Like, yeah. It makes me not want to just just scream an existential terror. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Glenn, huh? Glenn. No kid. Glenn. Wow. Glenn Borland. Who's that? Oh, that's that's right. That. that makes no sense at all. My, my God. All right. Oof. But it's episodes like the liquidation of the Romani camp that caused one Nazi doctor named Heinz Thilo to give Auschwitz the name of Anus Mundi, or just simply the Anus of the world. Oh, my God. But he didn't call it that because of all the horrible atrocities that they were committing there. To give you an idea of the pure disdain they had for other people, they saw Auschwitz as the place where the world disposed of its biomedical waste. And in Auschwitz... That especially meant the Jewish people. Now, and the thing about this, they viewed the people that volunteered for it also in very specific ways. Because a lot of times people went there, again, to avoid going to the Eastern Front. And we're also going to find, just like Yosef Mengele, uh, they went because they were a fucking monster. And they knew that they could handle it. Mm -hmm. And cowards. Yes, absolutely. And there were a lot of reasons why Auschwitz worked, because when it comes down to it, even though genocides are a gigantic part of human history that continue to this day, shit like this, it does, it's not in normal human nature. You're not, no. so, it is completely against human nature. Because we as a species, we evolved as a collaborative animal. Yes, we have wars and genocides and murders, but the vast, vast majority of humans who have existed throughout the eons Never killed another person. Right. Never killed anyone. Because it's against human nature. There was an interesting factoid I was reading about. was on the the mentality of uh, soldiers that shoot to kill, that have specifically shot to kill in various wars. And in the beginning of time, it was like this kind of concept that like really only 2% of people 
that have fought in wars have fired their gun directly at an enemy, enemy combatant, especially in the beginning of war, was like muskets and shit like that. It was used more to like try to people wouldn't get hit all the time they would be shooting a musket basically being like get away go away run away run away because people have a really like the dan carlin described the idea of being on the front lines of a bayonet fight mm. and how a lot of times back in the day when it got down to just two people with bayonets one person would just run away there are very few people that got murdered by stabbing another dude in the middle of a gigantic bayonet fight because it is very difficult to look at the face of another human being and kill them your your body doesn't want to do it they called it it's frostbite of the finger was a term that they said because the people's trigger fingers would stick when they would look at somebody in the eyes and then shoot them mm -hmm. so you have to dehumanize your opponent to such a degree where you can leap over uh this biological um uh, aversion to murder that was bf skinner and what he added to the military training industry Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's a huge function of propaganda mm -hmm. is to dehumanize the enemy. I mean, you know, we watch movies like, you know, Full Metal Jacket, and it talks about, you know, the training of uh, Marines, you know, what makes the grass grow, blood, blood, blood. Like, you right. really have to kill something within another human being to make this shit possible. And then if you look at the plot of the movie Good Burger, you think about, <laughs> you know, the the other burger company. I was really I, thinking uh, about this yeah. quite a bit during <laughs> and as I, I was reading about Auschwitz, I always thought of Hey Goober, welcome to Good Burger. <laughs> Can I take your order? That's all I thought of. But then if you really think about it, like my brain has evolved now, maybe the other burger company wasn't that bad. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Maybe they maybe they were just demonized by Keenan. Hey guys, today's last podcast on the left is brought to you by Article. Article is a furniture company that makes beautiful, well-made furniture that looks great in any room. It's absolutely fabulous. They're modernly designed pieces inspired by Scandinavian simplicity. I think the Scandinavians can be pretty complex though, but they not only look stylish, they're also affordable. Article is an online-only furniture company. They've eliminated the layers of traditional retail so they can keep prices low and quality high. No showrooms, no salespeople, just savings and cabinets. All those cabinets alone in a warehouse actually makes me lonely. Buy one and let them keep you company. And no matter how many pieces you order, Article is serious about shipping. Every order, no matter how many items, gets shipped at a flat rate of $49. Need help getting set up? Article has options for in-room delivery and for assembly assistance. And I'll tell you what, as a person that I, I should not be left to put things together. I put together a bed for my Kia and I thought I was going to go ham. In-stock items can be expected in two weeks or less. And Article has the best customer service in the biz. The customer is always first, and they have great 30-day return policy. And I got to be honest with you, that stellar customer service got me loving Article right away. Just hearing about it from Marcus, because they sent a team over to the studio to help them put together, I believe, several coffee tables. And they went up the rookety studio stairs, and with Article's help, we had our furniture professionally assembled right away, which is... Thank goodness none of us did it, because we are professional speakers. We're not actually good with our hands. Article is offering our listeners $50 off their first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash last. Again, that's all it takes. Go to article.com slash L-A-S-T, and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's article.com slash L-A-S-T to get $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Now, we've already talked about the general socialization towards something beyond hatred in German society, but a further socialization had to occur within Auschwitz itself, and chief among the psychology of this place was its isolation. Mm. The camp itself was tucked away in a far-flung region of Poland, which essentially cut off everyone from the rest of the world. If you were in Auschwitz, whether you were a prisoner or a Nazi, Auschwitz was the world. And that's a cult like. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very cult like. That, is, that well, is a cult like. Uh, that is a cult like technique. Mm -hmm. And I'm not equating these two things, but this is still what we do when it comes to prisons, right? This yeah. is why you always say, oh, they're getting sent upstate. It's never downtown. Wouldn't you be upset if there was a Supermax prison? 
just in Greenpoint. <laughs> we not be like into it. <laughs> I think it's important to see what's going on so we don't forget them. When we drove yeah. from Phoenix to um, to California, it is so funny. First of all, Phoenix, Arizona is different than California. Dan yeah. and Tope, and then you cross yeah. the California line, and they're like, it grass is, exists. Yeah, it what the hell is very it? But we were driving, and off in the far distance, we or first on the road, we see this this sign that says, "Don't pick up hitchhikers." Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there's a prison nearby. I forget what they said. Prisoners are often hitchhiking, whatever. Yeah, and then you look way, way, way off in the distance and you can see this blip and you're Mm -hmm. like that is a freaking federal prison yeah and they are so isolated oh yeah Uh, so you forget about them you forget about them and it's of course demoralizing and obviously that's not uh, the same thing as auschwitz but it's it's a common used technique it's not yeah it's definitely the same type of technique because like something like this something like auschwitz it's not going to fly in the middle of berlin if you're going home to a family every night and you're walking by people on the street who are just going about their day right it's not going to work at all but if every single person Person you see is also involved in the same shit that you're involved in, no matter if they're doing the killing or if they're the ones being killed, then the entire thing gets normalized. Suddenly, mm. that is the world and that is all that matters. It's like if you had a Captain Spaulding's chicken restaurant in LaGuardia Airport. <laughs> yes. This is a little strange and encrypted for an airport, isn't it? And I am not validating the soldiers within Auschwitz, too, but it's very interesting to see by them volunteering to go and serve in Auschwitz. They themselves became prisoners. They subscribe themselves to the same exact world that the prisoners were in. They were forced to live in it. And little did they know, had shit actually gone down, like if the if the Nazis had won World War II, honestly, and had taken over Europe, they probably all would have been liquidated as well. Yes. Well, I will play the world's smallest accordion for them because the sympathy is hard to drudge up for the people. I just think, <laughs> no, I just think that they're, it's not, it's not about sympathy. It's just this concept of like, they're all delusional. It's this whole thing, this concept that like, you're going to get out of clean out of this scenario no as well. You're fucked. Mm hmm. Well, the thing about the, all of this as well is that it was all approached in just the coldest way possible. I mean, one survivor said that the disturbing thing was that this was not something passionate or irrational. He said that there was nothing emotional about Auschwitz. And I don't know why that got me more than anything. Right. Is that it's just, it's just cold. What's the hopelessness of the idea of looking at somebody and you think that you can plead with them and connect to them on their humanity, but they look at you over a bi- like a clipboard like you're a, a nobody. Mm-hmm. It is yeah. very disheartening. Yeah. I mean, it's a government facility. Yeah. You know, it's the a billion times worse than a DMV experience. And you just yeah. imagine feeling like trash when you go there. Mm-hmm. And now you have this situation. But maybe the biggest thing that kept Auschwitz going was pure perpetual motion. See, as far as the mass murder went, once they started killing people, it became necessary to keep killing in order to justify the killing that came before. Because if you stop for even a minute, then it might enter your brain that what you've been doing is kind of fucked up and completely wrong. So for many of them, the thought was that Auschwitz wasn't something you can change. It's just something that you might as well go along with because that's the way the world is. Mm. One person even compared it to systems of government. Like, you know, you may say... Okay, there's some things wrong with democracy, but it's still the best system we've got. He looked at Nazism that way. Because they thought that Nazism, even with Auschwitz, was the best of all possible worlds. Right. Conformity at its most devious and fucked up. Because you built up a new social hierarchy when you go to Auschwitz. There was a very interesting essay i was reading i can't remember the name of it i was sending it to send it to marcus but a part of it's talking about how basically everybody shows up into this new social structure and so now it's like now that i'm in this world i'm just gonna keep it going because if i stop if i gunk up the works i'm on the other side of the clipboard Mm -hmm. now all this can be traced back to a single word Zonderbehandlung. What was that? Zonderbehandlung. Mm. Zonderbehandlung. <laughs> Zonderbehandlung, uh, which in German means special treatment. This was the euphemism that they used when they were really talking about mass murder. This imperative set certain people, but especially the Jews, apart from everyone else and marked them for death. And since they were marked for death, then psychologically speaking, as far as the Nazis were concerned, the Jewish people were already dead. Mm. And if they were already dead, 
then one needed to feel no guilt about anything that was done to him, whether it be sending him to the gas chambers or mutilating them while still alive in the pursuit of their version of science. Mm. Now, a lot of these guys, I mean, they had to get fucking trashed to carry out their duties just to dampen what little humanity they had left, which is actually pretty interesting because it's not dissimilar to how serial killers like Jeffrey Dahmer and mm. Ted Bundy had to get close to blackout to do the same fucking thing. Right. Yeah, because right. it allowed their monster to take over. Essentially, like the other, the bad side of the personality needed, the, which was the real them, needed to come through the booze in order for them to fuck. They had to like unleash the beast. Well, you can't but, have any sensitivity whatsoever. So you're already got, you're already German. Yeah. I don't think you need to desensitize. <laughs> um, I would say take some Molly. Uh, maybe try to oh get some God. feelings of love into your body. Oh God, <laughs> I don't know. If it, I don't know. Know if the Nazis could have handled my <laughs> what is this joy? Uh, no. What is this? I love this fleece sweater I'm wearing. I can't <laughs> believe I never noticed how wonderful the texture of it is. <laughs> the, the last thing they needed was Thunderbolt. That's all I've or, or, uh, or whiskey, you know. Oh uh, well, they definitely loved meth. In fact, they uh, created meth. Yeah. But that is a whole different episode. Yes, indeed. a more Kept fun it, episode, which uh, we'll do one day. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, if you want to read a, an awesome book about that, go read a blitzed it's well, really fucking great yeah, technically really- it helped them beat the Ru- the ruskies the uh, russians it it not technically it absolutely caused them to take over the Fra- the french Ugh. blitzkrieg it's it's fascinating go read blitzed it's very good but in this entire process the one person who was always without fail sober was joseph mengele Ooh. Judging from his behavior, Mengele never once questioned what he was doing or how he was doing it during his entire time at the camp. Now, to really understand Auschwitz, we got to understand all the functions of the camp. It worked in three capacities, concentration, slave labor, and annihilation, which included experimentation. See, the reason why they were called concentration camps in the first place was because they were, as we said last time, originally built to hold or concentrate political prisoners. Mm. See, at first, Auschwitz just held Polish political prisoners in addition to being used for quarantine and transit. As Auschwitz sat at a railway junction with 44 parallel tracks, that meant that people from all over Europe could easily be transported there by train. But as the German war machine chugged along, the Germans found that their country wasn't up to the task of providing the labor that was needed to take on damn near everyone else in the entire world except for Japan and Italy. Mm -hmm. So Auschwitz, among other concentration camps, expanded and became a slave labor camp as well. And it wasn't just for war-specific industries either. 34 German companies, many of whom still exist today, including Telefunken, who makes high-end stereo equipment. These guys earned a collective profit of $160 million in today's money mm. off of slave labor just in Auschwitz. That doesn't even count the other concentration camps. Auschwitz is just the most profitable one. Yeah, and of course that happens. You know, if we, We've discussed this before as well when it comes to our prison systems here. You know, cheap slave, slave labor is nothing new, and these corporations have been uh, benefiting off of it for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And the most notorious of these corporations was IG Farben. In addition to using Auschwitz III for the production of synthetic rubber, IG Farben provided the poisonous Zyklon B gas that was used to execute people in Auschwitz II Birkenau. So the company that was creating the chemicals that were killing the uh, the prisoners were also making the prisoners create the the chemical that would then kill them and and they profited well, off well, of it. Well, B was made elsewhere, okay. but these guys yes. were making like they were they had a synthetic rubber factory uh, at um, Auschwitz three. Okay, uh, but that was also a huge uh, argument among the Nazis. They were like, "Why are we killing them when we can have them just work until they die?" Well, that's what they were trying to do, and then it was finally <sighs> when the final solution came down because Hitler just finally gave the he said that this is the final solution, this is what we're doing, and then everybody hopped to it. But up until then, there was a constant argument right. between the military 
leaders of the concentration camps and the science officers of the concentration camps because they were like, we need bodies for experimentations. And they're like, we are trying to build more bombs. We're using these people to build bombs. We need more of them. And so it's very strange to see the political arguments yeah. within this world. A, a very macabre corporate boardroom mm-hmm. in that situation. Absolutely yeah, man, I, disgusting. I'm on a television show set in hell. Yeah. And it is that. It is yeah. the office set in hell. It, it really is, the, is. It is the worst g- place to work and talk that yeah. could possibly have existed. Mm-hmm. I could almost go for another home improvement fact. I don't know when <laughs> one's coming up, but <laughs> no, almost. still, you just wait. Just okay. wait. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. No, right. no, there's plenty more to go, Kessel. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we're right. locked into this thing. Well, this is going to be a long episode, but a par- part of that is that we need to fucking show the fucking spotlight on as much detail as possible that we can't even cover uh, the full extent right. in just this episode. Hey, do you want a New Year's resolution you can actually keep? I'm like all the lies we say to ourselves in the mirror. Stop going to the post office to send letters and packages when you don't have to. You don't have to, people. You don't gotta put on pants. Save time and money this year by using Stamps.com instead. Stamps.com is the faster, more convenient way to get postage. Simply use your computer to print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. And the mail carrier picks it up. How's that? How's them apples? Apple sauce, bitch. I don't remember what that's from. No more lugging mail to the post office. No more hassles. Stamps.com not only saves you time, it saves you money, too. With Stamps.com, you get discounted postage rates that you can't even get at the post office. Don't even go to that house of lies. Not to mention, it's a fraction of the cost of those expensive postage meters. And there's no equipment to lease and no long-term commitments. I use Stamps.com in order to get postage for the thank you letters for Natalie and I's wedding. We went and we got all these cute-ass stamps with Wendy on them. And they're so cute because Wendy's in her little wedding dress. And we did that. And I am not good at things. I'm not good at organizing all this posted shit. All right? So this is just the best way to send things out, the best way to send out merch. And we ship it out to all y'all each week and every week using Stamps.com. So if you've got stuff to mail, ship or send, Stamps.com is a must. And right now, you too can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale. So start the new year off right. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in L-E-F-T. That's stamps.com and enter left. Well, IG Farben also owned Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Bayer paid the night. And this is Bayer that you still can buy at CVS. For my headaches? For your headaches. Because I have have a heart problem? Same fucking company. Bayer paid the Nazis at Auschwitz 170 Reichmarks, or $68 American at the time, for 150 female inmates for the purpose of drug experimentation. And when all of them died as a result, Bayer just asked for more, and Uh. they gave them more. But as far as the labor in Auschwitz that these companies profited from went, inmates were literally worked to death in the service of the Nazis and these companies. On average, a prisoner would last three to six months before dropping dead of starvation or disease. But Auschwitz's most infamous purpose was annihilation. Now, prior to places like Auschwitz and other pure killing camps like Kelno and Belzec, I think I'm saying that right, Kelno, Belzec. All right. Yeah. The answer to Hitler's Jewish question were mobile SS death squads called the Einsatzgruppen. The Einsatzgruppen were solely tasked with the cold-blooded killing of civilians. These guys traveled in the wake of the main German force that was making its way east towards Russia. These guys were the closest thing that history has gotten to unleashing a roving band of serial killers into the world. These are among the most terrifying people that have ever existed. And like I imagine, the mix of people that volunteer for the heavy service in any sort of military forces, it is a combo of those two, right? It's people that kind of ended up in this fucking group uh, against their will, and it's also surrounded by total mean fucking bastards that can't wait to be bullies to everybody that they meet. They actually weren't a part of the regular army. They were kind of like... Private contractors, kind of? No, they were still a part of the German government, but they weren't a part of the regular army. They would Mm. get support from the regular army, but they were a different... 
different part of it altogether. Uh, and in fact, sometimes like they they treated them almost like uh, wild dogs, uh, where oh if someone was getting too much into it, uh, these death squads, right. if someone was getting too much into it, they'd pull them back. Like they pull a magazine. Like, okay, you need to cool off. You need to where you need to go back here for a little while. How bad? Hey, do you good ha- hustle, though. Good hustle. And slap him on the butt like it's fucking the NFL. Yeah. How bad do you have to get? Just imagine how bad you would have to get for a German officer to tell you to cool it. Yeah. During World War II. Yeah. yeah. That is that is disgusting to think about. Yeah. These guys they traveled in seven battalions of about five hundred men each. They murdered an estimated sixty-five. Thousand people in Poland in 1939 alone. They killed Polish leadership. They killed clergy. They t- killed teachers, and especially they killed Jews. This was expanded in 1941 with the invasion of Russia, when the leader of the Einsatzgruppen gave the order for all male Jews between the age of 15 and 45 to be shot immediately on sight, in addition to any Romani they might find. Mm. By August of that year, the order was expanded further to include the entire population. So now you had, imagine this, seven groups of 500 serial killers searching for a very specific type of victim and having the full power of a government and an army behind them Mm. to accomplish this task. I mean, honestly, and they were... They were rewarded for what they did, but also kind of kept at arm's length, right? Because, again, they're doing the dirty work. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to include them with the main pack because then that would sully the righteous power of the Nazis after they won the war. And, of course, you start with 15 to 45-year-old men because those are the people that are most likely to have the ability to fight back and defend themselves and defend their people. Get used to it. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's just so unbelievably planned out Mm -hmm. yeah it went from uh, men and then eventually it was men women children the elderly babies whoever they were all killed by firing squads they shot them in front of mass graves they dug the mass graves first they lined everyone up and then they just shot them you know 100 200 at a time (sighs) and then all the bodies would just fall backwards into the hole they just did it over and over again in september a mass execution of this kind lasted for two days straight outside of Kiev in Ukraine at a place called Babi Yar. Here, 33,771 Jews were made to lie on the bodies of the ones that came before and were shot one by one in the head. Two days straight, never stopping, Mm. almost 34,000 people. And some of these people actually survived the initial shot and spent days conscious and dying under a mountain of corpses. And by the end of October, the Einsatzgruppen, just that one, just that one battalion who'd committed that massacre, they claimed a further 70,000 Jewish lives in just three months. Jesus. This is honestly, once again, I'm getting close to a home improvement fact here. This is getting pretty brutal. Colleges and universities in Michigan would send Tim Allen sweaters and T-shirts to wear during tapings of home improvement. Oh, hold on a second. And and he did. Okay, so that's how he was always wearing them. (laughs) So Tim Allen's... That's an interesting fact. (laughs) Tim Allen's sweaters were sent from from universities. Some universities and schools all over Michigan. Really? All over Michigan? All over Michigan. Wow. And I'm still kind of haunted by Glenn Borland. (laughs) Yeah. We're going to have a main character on a show called Glenn Borland? (laughs) Weird. Yeah. Wow. And then all the sweaters there from... from, He loved Michigan. He loved Michigan. He's a Michigan guy, so... (laughs) Uh, naturally, it's good he's promoting the uh, the education system there in the great state of, uh, of Michigan. Check out uh, check out Lake Superior. Um, it's got uh, kind of fun if you like if you like water. And it almost deserves a name. It's a nice lake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the Nazis they had a problem with the Einsatzgruppen, and the Einsatzgruppen. I mean, we. That we lightly touched on the the atrocities of the Einsatz Group, and that could be a series in and of itself. We <sighs> barely brushed the surface of it. But the problem that the Nazis had was that these mass executions they were just too darn stressful on all these Nazis. Oh, I was that about to problem? say that. It does sound really stressful. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's the big issue here: the stress on the Nazis. Well, they were becoming. You know what it is, op- and because my the thing about the Nazis, the my, my biggest, I think that their biggest crime 
hypocrisy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were becoming alcoholics. They were losing their minds uh, or just plain shooting themselves in the fucking head because they couldn't live with what they were doing. I mean, right. the Einsatz, the Einsatz commandos had and ex- it's had the highest rate of suicide of anyone. So the Nazis figured, OK, so we're not going to stop with this final solution thing. We're not going to stop with, you know, exterminating all of these people. So we got to find a different way to do it. So starting in late 1941, the Nazis took Action T4, which we talked about last episode with the mental patients and, you know, all of the people that were considered undesirable Mm -hmm. to the Nazis. They took all that infrastructure and they moved it to the concentration camps where they were already holding political prisoners. And therefore, the final solution was put into action. Because and they did it solely because the hard way was too hard. Yeah. So right. they wanted to find a way to make it more uh, industrialized. They wanted to make it more like a big factory so we can do them in bunches so we don't have to think about them, which is then ironic because then it took all the way. It actually, then Josef Mengele took that whole scenario and went again and made it personal. Mm-hmm. Where in a world of faceless mass extermination, Mengele really was a true serial killer getting actually close to the mayhem that he was doing. But the problem was that if you were just killing them, then you'd end up with the same problems that you had with the Einsatz commandos because Mengele was a singular character. I mean, he was very, very much uh, in a league of his own. So the Nazis found a way to medicalize the killing process in the camps. And the experiments of Joseph Mengele were a part of that medicalization. So when a person arrived at Auschwitz on a train car packed with other prisoners, they were let out onto what was known as the selection ramp. This was the place the SS doctors would decide who would die in the work camps, who would die immediately, and who would be chosen for experimentation. Now really, anyone could have done these selections when it came to picking those who could work and those who couldn't. Anyone could do that. Right. But if you had doctors in charge of the whole thing, then it gave the process a medical legitimacy. That's Mm. what Mengele said he was an expert on. He was part of the people that kind of sued for us doctors should be doing the selections because because i can tell races by facial structure like he had this like thing they they were doing this ancient medicine where he said that he could pick out what he needed properly Mm. by like their ear shape all this kind of stuff that makes no real sense now of but course. at the time was like actual hard science in a world of batshit madness the craziest batshit person come comes out on top yeah and and really like i mean the the whole thing was uh it was a psychological process for the nazis as well because these guys they practiced like this kind of weird twisted bedside manner they treated the new arrivals they treated them with this false respect this kindness like oh hello ma'am how are you or are you feeling okay did you have a nice trip yes please come with me this is partly to keep the transports calm but it also helped the nazis to lie to themselves that, right that helped them to say that this whole thing was just a medical procedure we're doing it to the entire world this is the festering appendix right. that must be removed uh, it's such- like what we were talking about the last time about how why serial killers have wives and families and shit like that where it's all part of it is this part of an internal game is this the game that we're playing in terms of making it extra evil or is it the creating of a side personality being like see there's no way i could do all these crimes i'm a normal guy i do all this normal shit but but when the night comes when the when the shadow self takes over then they are free to do your crimes. And for Mengele, that was in his office. This is uh, So this is how the Germans were able to, to say that this is not something inhumane. This is something medical. Yes, this is something medical. That's, and they did it from the very beginning. They had to start the entire process with this is something that is medical. Ugh. And the doctor, who was almost always in the middle of it all, was who else but Joseph Mengele. With graceful, quick movements, sometimes while whistling an operatic melody, Mm. Mengele Mengele would send people either to work or to the trucks. Mengele was only one of two SS doctors who could work the selections completely sober. The other 
was a particularly virulent anti-Semite named Dr. Fritz Klein, who was said to have developed his hatred of the Jews after a Jewish dude seduced his fiancée in college. Man, oh my god, oh of man. course. Of course it all stems from a cock block. Yeah, yeah it's a fucking good Yeah, it's god. a stupid cucked nerd yep. in college to take his rage out on everybody else. Unbelievable. So strong was his hatred that he was overheard once to have said to actually like the smell of the crematoriums. Ugh. But I will say, that was, uh, you know, when Mengele showed up, the first he was like, oh, the water's a terrible smell. Oh, gosh, I have to get used to that. But he did it like that, where he's just like, you just get used to it when you start hanging out in it. And he was so vain, he would dress up. And the one thing that everyone said that was that would stick out in their mind about Mangala when he would show up on the line was that he was incredibly clean. Mm. That in Auschwitz, it was incredibly difficult to be clean. It was uh, dusty roads, muck, literal shit ravines where people are emptying out the latrines onto the street. I mean, blood from the various, I mean, literally mass shootings and also from the surgeries he was doing. But also, it's under constant construction. So it's just this, like, sawdust and dirt. But they said he would show up fucking dressed to the nines, completely impeccable, with his white gloves on, singing his opera song, sending you to the left or sending you to the right, laughing at, or eventually screaming with rage, looking for twins. Mm -hmm. Absolutely horrifying. Yeah. And for over a million people, Mangala was uh, the first person they saw when they got to Auschwitz. He was either Mangala or Klein or uh, a whole other rotating cast of assholes. Right. Because they kept missing his twins. Yeah. So he would he would go in and take more ramp duty. He kept showing up being like and he would negotiate with the guys that were in charge of and take over their shifts so that he could make sure that he could get the specimens that he needed. Mm. Well, if you were sent to the right, it was on to the camp. But if you were sent to the left, that was immediate death. And most children under the age of 12 were selected for execution because they couldn't work. It was also the elderly, the pregnant, the sick. They were also sent to the left. Ugh. They were all loaded into trucks painted with the Red Cross symbol and told that they were going to the camp for the sick and the children. So complete was the Nazis' deception that some people actually chased down the trucks saying that they had diabetes or a heart condition. It's like, no, 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 I need to go. I need to go too. Please take me, take me. But these were the trucks that were being sent to the gas chambers. Out of each transport, which held about 1,500 people, 75 to 90 percent of them were sent immediately to the crematoriums and were dead within five hours of arriving mm. at Auschwitz. Now, there were four crematoriums in Auschwitz, each one holding 15 ovens. Each person followed an iron ramp inside, above which was a sign that said, Baths and Disinfecting Room in German, French, Greek, and Hungarian. Once inside, the people were instructed by numerous signs to undress completely. They then had to tie their shoes together by the laces and hang all of their clothes carefully on the pegs provided, as they were told that they would need to easily find them later after they all took a shower after their long trip to the camp. Mm. In reality, this was done so the clothes could be easily collected for distribution amongst German citizens whose lives were destroyed by the war. But after the prisoners stripped naked, they would then be led to a 200-meter long room perforated with iron pipes. Then the Nazis turned out the lights. Unbeknownst to the people now terrified in the dark, another Red Cross truck driven by an SS doctor carrying a load of Zyklon B had just arrived outside. And that doctor, a member of what was called the Hygienic Institute, would then deliver the poison by dumping pellets through vents in the roof or holes in the side of the chamber. And as the gas filled the room, the stronger ones among the victims would trample the young and the old as they tried to climb upwards, scratching at each other and their own throats in a desperate attempt to breathe in the pitch blackness. Mm. The victims' faces would turn blue and blood would pour from their eyes, ears, and nose. This horrific ordeal would last up to five minutes, but some who died in the chambers survived for up to 20. So after the murders came the disposal of the bodies, but this wasn't done by the Nazis. 
This task was left to what was called the Sonderkommando, which was made up solely of other Jewish prisoners. And it is extremely graphic. I know for those listening, it's really hard to hear that stuff, but it is important to hear what it was like because otherwise we can't forget the history. We're going to be mm. destined to repeat it as that old cliche goes, but it's a, it's, it's a cliche for a reason. It's, it's very true. This is where it ends. Th- yeah. This is where the shit leads to. Yeah, absolutely. It's where Mengele had a form that he signed off on and he sent it out the door, mm. and then he never saw any of this process. It literally was just a bureaucratic little movement right. that set this whole thing in motion. So just that's what my, that's what I'm thinking of is the fact that this is fucking his fault. Every single one of these pieces of shit who signed a piece of paper did this shit, Absolutely. and they had this on their hands, and they tried to act like it was just some it was just a part of business at the camp. And that's when we talk about politics or policy. There's the the real world ramifications of somebody signing a signature on the mm-hmm. bottom of a page. That's what it looks like. It can look like that. So yeah. we yeah, we always have to remember that. And Mingala was the one who sent these people there. Now, the Sonderkommando, their main job was to dispose of the bodies, but they were also tasked to search the teeth of every corpse for gold caps and fillings, then pull them so they could be melted down and added to the war effort, along with whatever jewelry the victims were wearing. Then the corpses were jagged 25 at a time to the incineration room. Once there, the ovens would be opened, and bodies would be thrown in three at a time, every ten minutes, into a furnace that was heated to incandescence. Once a week, the ashes would be taken out, pulverized, and loaded into trucks, where they would then be taken to the River Whistla and thrown from the banks to be washed away. Mm. Eventually, though, the crematoria weren't enough to handle all the bodies that needed to be burned. Because as one person said, and I think it was uh, science in the swastika, killing people is easy. Getting rid of bodies is difficult. So the bodies, they just started throwing them into flaming trenches, and they used human body fat as an accelerant because it was cheaper and more effective than benzene. I wonder what else there is to learn about home improvement. Yeah, I could kind of go for a a tool time break, (laughs) if if possible. Because remember, we already learned that it's uh, Glenn Borland, possibly. Which is awful. And it's crazy. Tim Allen, we've also learned. uh, And again, ladies and gentlemen, we're doing this so we can all live um, and (laughs) not emotionally cry in this podcast. And Tim Allen, Allen, we also learned he had his sweaters sent from universities in Michigan. So, okay. In one episode of Home Improvement, it said that Tim Taylor is three years older than his wife, Jill. Oh, okay. okay yeah. But in real life, Patricia Richardson is two years older than Tim Allen. Get the, get I think the, he should apologize. Wow. I think that Tim Allen should apologize for this wow. kind of lying. This is what I'm going to be lied to. I'm a home improvement fucking junkie. I'm a, I'm a, wow. we call ourselves improvies. I'm a oh. member of the improvies and I don't know this kind of shit. Really? I'm a tool timer. I'll show within the show. Interesting. So Tim Allen, younger in real life. He should apologize. He, yeah, younger in real life. And you know, uh, uh, the, the wife, Patricia Richardson. Richardson, she didn't like the one-dimensional role that she played on that show. Yeah, she, she I'll tell you what, and she's dimension. She's complicit in these lies. <laughs> well, and I think she should also be forced to be oh. punished and to apologize to her audience. Oh my goodness! Wow, and what a, we're learning a lot of different things today. Okay. Now earlier I said that most children were sent to the left, but there were a select few that were saved. See, when each transport came in, one word could be heard above all others echoing through these train cars. Zwillinge, Zwillinge. In German, Zwillinge meant twins. And that right there was the main reason why Joseph Mengele was present at most of the arrivals. It wasn't really because he enjoyed it. He just didn't trust anyone else to make sure all the twins were collected. Mengele was the only one who would show up to selections even when it wasn't his turn, 
just to make sure that no twins slip through his fingers. This Dwight Schrute motherfucker <laughs> out <laughs> there just being a nerd about it. Like, that's the yeah. thing, too. Just being that kind of officious fucking nerd, too. Because not on top of all this shit, it's literally being like, you don't know how to do your job correctly. <laughs> so it's like, it's all the layers right. of yeah. being a fucking shithead. Well, here is the fatal flaw in Mengele's whole plan. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Oh, this. I was <laughs> oh wondering. God. I was wondering when it his, because so far it's been a fucking luck. Well, in order to truly study twins, you gotta just study. You gotta just study identical qu twins. Hmm. But Mengele, he took fraternal twins as well, which is pretty much about as useful as just studying siblings. There's no difference, like, with fraternal twins, like, there's uh, the same difference between fraternal twins as, like, say, you and your brother, you know, uh, genetically. But identical right. twins, you know, identical. I wish I was more identical to my brother Chris. He was a model, and he, <laughs> he modeled very in Milan, Italy. He is very handsome. Well, he, I, I you know, he's aging was. and everything like that. I am two years younger. I don't want to, <laughs> not, not to bite our tool time, uh, you know, trivia. <laughs> But it would have been nice if I looked more like him. Well, because of this, all of Mengele's work was completely, utterly, and totally useless. Oh, that's the saddest thing. About, no, well, that's not the saddest thing about all this. But it's the most infuriating thing about all this. Yeah, I mean, it's as one observer said, you know, a scientist who was speaking on one of these documentaries. He said, when you lose all moral inhibitions... You stop caring about the rational details, it's, and therefore, it's all in vain. So, literally, Jeffrey Dahmer is is just as much of a scientist in trying to create a zombie yeah, kind as, of as, as Mengele. Because yeah. all, all of it's shit. You can really only compare them as if, jo if Jeffrey Dahmer would have gotten a promotion for his work. And right. if he had shown it to an actual boss that said, <laughs> Jeff, I gotta say... This is pretty great. Yeah, you because this it. happened a couple of times, too, because that's what Mengele did. Mengele did this because these were the hot <coughs> projects. The idea of being able to physically manipulate any human population to make them look like the Aryan race. That mm. was what his job was. He was the worst version of the show botched. That's what he... <laughs> that was his goal. But, on the other hand, since he also took fraternal twins... A lot more kids survived Auschwitz than if he didn't do that, because some pairs of brothers and sisters who just looked alike and were close in age, they were able to pass. And so, therefore, they were saved. Okay. But that's also what Mengele used an excuse afterwards to his fucking son, where yeah. he's just like, but no, I mean, how many people v would have gone to the crematorium if uh. I wasn't doing my experiments? Just being like, yeah, buddy. Yeah. yeah good. Oh, yeah? And he also tried to, and he also tried to soften a little bit. He's like, you know, sometimes I send people to, to the work camps that should have gone to the crematorium, but I just send Ugh. them to the work camps because that's just what? the kind of guy I am. It's disgusting. Someone give him the Meryl Streep Award of the best person in the world. I don't know what that award <laughs> is. I don't know what it is. My God. But twins weren't the only ones given preferential treatment here. There was one other thing that Auschwitz, and specifically the experimental part of the camp, needed. That was doctors. And those doctors, these Jewish doctors, ended up as the personal slaves of Mengele and other doctors in the SS. The most well-known of these doctors forced to work for the Nazis at Auschwitz was Miklos Niesli, a Jewish pathologist who arrived in Auschwitz with his wife and daughter in June of 1944. Upon his arrival, Miklos heard Mengele shouting for doctors, so he and 50 others stepped forward. Mengele then asked who had studied at a German university and was familiar with forensic pathology. Miklos was then the only one to step forward. And after a short interview as to where he studied and who his professors were, Miklos was taken to a camp office a few hundred yards away and registered as a doctor. Now, Miklos thought that he was going to be sent to some German city as a replacement for a doctor who'd been drafted. But what he was actually about to become was Mengele's own personal pathologist. <sighs> what that meant was that Miklos was going to have to dissect hundreds of corpses post-experimentation under the direction of Dr. Mengele. And this is one of those areas where we get into some revisionist history, as Henry has alluded to before. You can go down in a YouTube hole, and then they can say, well, look, there were Jewish doctors. Um, there were people like Mengele. He, he was, he was, his servants were all Jewish, and there's some interviews with them. These people are just as much victims as anybody else. Yeah. Oh, and yes. uh, what, what would you do in that situation? Because there's a lot of people in the comment section of these videos being like, I would never. I would never, oh, whatever yeah. it is. No, you have no clue. You have no clue. 
was people there are with his with. wife and his daughter. Right. Mm-hmm. He was there with his family, and he they got passed, and a part of it got a little bit to do with the fact that he volunteered for this work. And also, if somebody's going to be doing it, at least it's me, because I know what I'm doing, and at least I know these people, and it's, it's just a... Yeah. Fucked up. It's a lot easier scenario to be. In. It's it's very easy to think you would be some massive hero um, when you're far removed. Yeah, completely you know? and totally removed. But before he even got to that position, Miklos had to have an audition. This he, shit, dude. He said <sighs> that he was brought to what he called a primitive shed-like dissection theater. Once inside, he was brought two corpses, which both had their chests marked with the letters Z and S, stood for Zur Section. One of those men had hanged himself. The other one had been electrocuted. God knows how. But as Miklo sat there with these two bodies, in came Mengele, two senior SS officers, and the other Jewish prisoner doctors. It's just like, it's such a scene from a fucking horror movie. It is, yes, man. They're with literally Dr. Mangala, one of the worst Ugh. human beings to ever exist, two of the his fucking imp-like evil cohorts, and now you got to, you better be an expert surgeon. Oh my mm-hmm. God, this is... Yeah, Miklos opened up the skull, the thorax, the abdomen, one of the dead. He extracted the organs. He noted the abnormalities and uh, answered questions posed by Mengele and the others. Mengele would just ask him questions in the middle of it, and he just had to perform. Uh, And so three days later, Mengele took Miklos to crematorium number one, or Miklos joined the ranks of the Zonderkommando to assist in the disposal of the bodies in the crematoriums in addition to his work as Mangala's pathologist. Mm. I do God. feel like there's almost a psychological game in these choices as well, because the the prisoners that were chosen to be prison doctors, and also the Sonder Commandos, were treated better. They were given more rations. They were given visitation rights to go to the other parts of the camp. They were given all of these things. And a part of it was, I believe, in a way, while they were also looking for able-bodied people, I think it was also a way of dividing the prisoners against themselves i think that the way that they would give these people horrible jobs but then treat them better was then a way to essentially psychologically divide the groups within the camp to sort of also like while while they would play their the, the idea of making people cheered going away to the gas gas chambers in order for them to not revolt i think it was the same way you keep them kind of divided amongst themselves mm-hmm. so they do not unite and rise against us yeah and it also to ensure that they don't unite and rise against you the zonder commando every four months it was about 860 usually in the zonder commando uh every uh four months they would all be killed Mm. yeah because they were called that was the the term the bearer of secrets where that came from because that's what they were labeled as because they knew what the gas chambers were yeah and uh, miklos's book uh, it was it's just called auschwitz uh it's the only first-hand written account we have of what the zonder commando actually had to do hmm Honestly, if you really want to ruin a fucking Sunday, <laughs> read that book. I it's a, it is obvious very <sighs> it is important yes. and it is yeah. uh you you it's important to read, but all of this shit, each one's a different punch to the fucking gut. Each one of these things you look and you, the the duress of these people wonder is unimaginable. Mhm. Mhm. Now the doctors of Auschwitz, including Mengele, they were kind of of a I don't know a different breed from the rank and file. Uh, by accounts, the doctors, most of them were gentlemen. These kind of guys just sort of came and went. They supervised actions. They smiled. Sometimes they would tell jokes, uh, but they said that they were never unhappy at least outside of the selections when they were just selections were awful everyone hated everyone except for Mengele and Klein hated selections right but otherwise it's just a job just kind of going about their day smiling laughing joking Uh, but the thing was that was part of Auschwitz's allure it was great for your career in the sense of being a Nazi. Yes. But only in the sense. Oh, only yeah. In the sense of being a Nazi, because Duty Done Well Auschwitz got you a pretty big feather in your hat, mostly because, you know, it showed loyalty and it showed a willingness to do anything. Right. But in terms of actual useful medical experience, Auschwitz offered absolutely nothing. Have you ever, if you ever look at the Hooker album? Hooker? The, it's the Hooker. It's with the O with the umlaut on top of it. I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it's Hooker. Yeah. Um, but it was an, uh, a photo album 
from a guy, an SS officer named Hooker, that was one of the only evidences of Mengele being at Auschwitz. And it's these, these pictures of Mengele and Hoss and his boss and just laughing and hanging out. That's where the pictures you see of the, of the SS officers like mm. laughing and having a good time. But it's just picture of them just all like, <laughs> like, like literally Mengele slapping his knee with a fucking big smile on his face, his fucking gap tooth, horrible mouth, Ricky Ricardo fucking hair yeah. sitting there and they're all enjoying themselves. But that's important to remember. These are human beings. These aren't some supernatural beasts. Like that, no. you know, it's, if you get a chance, I think we mentioned this, this on the last episode, Hitler on vacation. Mm -hmm. It's just absolutely insane to see that side of them in the midst of all of this blood and horror and, and disgusting situation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and these guys, you know, if they just wanted to be Nazis and Auschwitz was great, if they wanted to be a doctor, if they had absolutely no, I mean, the, Auschwitz offered nothing. Because the research held no value at all, and a lot of times they just they saved lives just so they could kill the person later in a different way. Yeah. And all the shit was done on a scale so vast that we'd have to add a whole other episode just to cover the medical experiments outside of what just Mengele was doing. I mean, there was an entire block dedicated solely to sterilizations. That was run by a guy named uh, Carl Klauberg. He actually... <laughs> rented space at Auschwitz from the Nazis, paid him one mark a week for prisoner doctors and human experimentees. Mm. He wasn't even a part of the military. He just rented space there to do sterilization work. That is can unbelievable. You, that makes Can you fucking imagine renting office space at Auschwitz? Good like literally God. going and renting a conference room <laughs> so that you could use it in Auschwitz. You could go anywhere. Yeah. You could literally go anywhere. But he went there specifically. That Klauberg is another fucking... This is what I'm saying. You just find another supervillain and another supervillain oh, yeah. yeah. and another supervillain every single time you turn in this story when you think about auschwitz and then you're like oh that could be a good like we work type space you know <laughs> where i'll rent it out hourly not bad that is so that's how systemic this was mm -hmm. yeah he just rented space and they let him do whatever he wanted <sighs> yeah, and there were collaborator doctors too like these guys that came in like polish uh prisoners non-jewish doctors like this one guy uh vladislaw daring he became so enthusiastic about working with the Nazis that he'd carry around a tobacco pouch that he'd made from the scrotum of a Jewish prisoner that they had Jesus sterilized. This and he'd is, show it to the other Jewish prisoners. This is a real life, um, you know, like Nightmare Before... Is it Nightmare Before Christmas? Yes, Nightmare Before Christmas. This is real life Halloween Town. It, well, Halloween Town uh, is fun. No, Halloween Town is wonderful. Wonderful. I'm not, no, no, I know, I know. I know. Don't talk Halloween, Halloween, Halloween Town. I'm not dissing Tim Burton's <laughs> Halloween Town. I understand <laughs> it is more of a children's movie. I am just saying, if the Boogie Man, Boogie Woogie Man, ran the show and he and there was no Jack Skeleton <laughs> to take him down, that is what we would have. So you're is, saying this is the logical end of the Boogie Boogie Man? This is no, it. it's not. No, it's not. He was a villain within. This is if Halloween Town was run by Nazis. And I would assure you, well, that is a, I mean, honestly, what a fantastic know. film. Jack Skeleton versus the Nazis is a fucking yes. great movie. I want to see another Jack Skeleton movie. We don't know the political leadings of Boogie Woogie Man. <laughs> it is extremely possible. That he was uh, for some reason, I view the Halloween town as a vaguely innocent place. It is. Well, Boogie Woogie Man was just happened to be a no, villain within that world. I'm not but he just had to be extra spooky. No, he was going to be spooky. Yes, I know that. And the Two Faced Mayor is amazing. What I'm saying is, if it was real. Did the, what did the Oogie Boogie Man do that was so awful? I just he, was he, was, he was full he of bugs. He was tried to kill Santa, Santa Claus. That's true. He, he felt tried like to he kill was the Santa right Claus. <laughs> and you don't remember that. But Santa Claus is a liar, first of all, and we all no. have to lie for him. No, that is a part of it. I will. I also blame Santa Claus for the fact that we are burdened with the lie of his existence on the on Not the show. Not in Halloween Town. In the in the movie, Santa Claus is telling the truth. He gave gifts. We have to we have to shelve this before we get more upset about this than about the Holocaust. Good Lord! All right. Well, as horrifying as the scrotum tobacco pouch of Ladislaw Daring is. It was nothing compared to the collections of Joseph Mengele. He began his experimentations in Auschwitz by seeing if he could change the pigmentation in children's eyes by injecting 36 children into the eyes Ugh. with different colored dyes. Just a, a dye, just a dye that you might use on hair or a piece of clothing. He just popped a needle in. Ugh. And injected it just to see what would happen. Right. And then he would dissect the eyes and he would send some to his boss 
to literally do to Hess and in order for it to get in front of Himmler because Himmler was the kind of dude that was like, I love this shit. This is what I want to see because yeah. he, the part of it again was the cosmetic angle yeah. that Mengele was trying to show because all of this was to him being like, see, see how good I am. Yeah, but even before that, I mean, that's the thing is that they didn't immediately, like, they didn't immediately murder them after this. They waited until there were infections. They waited until there were blindness because they were trying to see, right. oh, can we change the color of eyes just by injecting dye with a needle? But as soon as the kids are no longer useful, as soon as they were like, okay, well, we got all the information we have, uh, they were gassed. It's and also- they removed the eyes from the bodies. Ugh. One witness said that she later saw eyes, children's eyes. Pinned like butterflies, covering a wall in one of Mangala's laboratories. It is so. It's it. What's it? I mean, this everything's infuriating, but it's also just so stupid. Yeah, it is so dumb that they could yeah. think that they would be able to do this. You, you say wonder this, if man, they he even a- thought that they could, though, or if he was just justifying his sociopathy, uh, you know, complete psycho mind, and just saying like. Was he? I mean, did he really think this was gonna freaking work, dude? I think that the line is blurred here. I think that he began to believe that all of this was true. I think that as he was doing this, they they say that time and time again, he was a true believer. He was doing Ugh. this for the cause. He also thought it was gonna get him up in the ranks. He thought that it was gonna pay off for him, especially doing the really dirty shit because he knew the Nazis and his bosses loved the really fucked up stuff, and he wanted to show him how again how far he was willing to go. Ugh. And you, this is this is a an example of a mad scientist from a horror movie mm-hmm. like oh, yeah. he legitimately was just using it as a playground to kind of just see what he was doing like he was inventing dorito flavors i mean absolutely it's just fucking dis- i mean it's disgusting oh, this is just the beginning of it I well mean, i'm this almost is only the beginning of it okay i'm almost ready for another home improvement fact if we could uh i think i only got like one or two left okay yeah, yeah. we can yeah. hold them i'm just saying yeah. like, really? we're just powering yeah, 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 through yeah. this maybe we could yeah. put 10 more of those in <laughs> <laughs> well these sorts of experiments they were all a part of mangala's plan because in addition to the birthing aspect mangala also was trying to establish which attributes and disabilities were inherited genetically and which ones were acquired by lifestyle and environment and the advantage of using twins to study these sorts of things was that one child in the pair could be used as a control group so while one twin would endure experimentation the other would be left alone then should the experiment upon twin die after the experiment the twin who hadn't gone through the procedure would be killed as well and both would be dissected to compare how the experimentee's body had reacted (laughs) Or even if the child didn't die in the course of the experiment, both would be killed so they could be compared. All that mattered was the experiment. All that mattered was the result. And that there is what Mengele thought was the true value of working at Auschwitz. Because see, anywhere else, at any point in history, it was extremely rare that two twins should die in the same place at the same time. But in Auschwitz, that could happen on command whenever he wanted. Ugh. So all of the twins that were in line for Mangala's experiments were housed in Barrack 14 of Camp F in what was nicknamed the Zoo. There, the children were treated relatively well until the time came for either experimentation, death, or both. Mangala himself would actually visit the children on a regular basis and get to know them. He'd bring them chocolate, he'd bring them clothes, he'd bring, them, he'd bring ribbons for the little girl's hair... And he liked them in a particular way. One day, he walked in and freaked out at a caregiver because one of the ribbons in a little girl's hair was higher than the other. In Mengele's words, she was not how he liked her. So when you say relatively well, you mean like relatively well like James Caan in the movie Misery, when technically she did save him from a car crash, which Te- is kind of nice. No, um, I mean, it was enough where the kids were fond of, of Mangala. Oh, God. Because they didn't know. They had no clue what of was course, happening. Yeah. And then, but they uh, talk a lot, a lot in Mangala, the complete story, about how the, the old life Mangala would try to come forward, that a part of this was like, well, Mangala the father was the one who would be like meeting the meeting these kids and then they wouldn't meet Mengele the doctor until essentially after they had already died or as he was killing them. Right. Uh, but I think that there was never a Mengele the father. But no. that's that's always my view with a lot of these guys where I think that oh, he yeah. was born 
to be an evil shit stain. Oh, yeah. And died one. This is total manipulation. Absolutely. He knew what was going on. Well, one explanation put forth for this behavior is that Mengele had the same relationship with these children that one might have with lab rats. You know, you're going to have to kill the rat someday, but you might as well have a good relationship with it in the meantime. There's no reason to be mean to it. So, yeah, we'll be fine, but I know one day I'm going to have to kill you. Uh, Robert J. Lifton, in his book, The Nazi Doctors, he called this phenomenon doubling. He said that there were two parts to Mengele. There was his Auschwitz self and his prior self. The prior self, that was the healer, while the Auschwitz self was the killer. And this also kind of plays in to the Nazis' entire way of looking at this shit, mm -hmm. the healing-killing complex. And the best example of this involved a group of Jewish children who were suffering from Noma, which was a disease that causes painful mouth ulcers. And Mengele, he worked and worked on experimental cures. Eventually, he cured the kids. He made them feel better, you know, like they weren't in pain anymore. And that was his prior self. That was the actual doctor. That was the human. But once the children were cured, the Auschwitz self took over. Now that the kids were relatively healthy, they were once again a threat to the purity of the Aryan race. So as soon as they were fully recovered, mm. they were sent to the gas chambers. It's just unexplainable. Yeah. None of this is explainable. My brain is like having a real difficult time yeah. wrapping, and, wrapping itself around that logic or mm. lack thereof. Another example, Mangala uh, delivered a baby. There was a, a woman. She went into labor. He, he delivered the baby. He did it by the book. He used the utmost care. You know, it was like he had done it. He was like he was a doctor who did it 10 times a day. Even went so far, he delicately cut the umbilical cord, handed the baby to the mother, and almost immediately, both mother and child were sent to the gas chamber. Ugh. Sent them both And home. he what did it the with the flair of, like, take a look at this shit. Take a look what I can do. Like, I'm fucking, look how good I am. Because he was a bragger, and he was incredibly vain. I mean, Mengele, he even used this when the children were condemned to die. I mean, he'd take the kids sometimes. He'd take them to the chamber himself, uh, and he turned the whole uh, walk into a game. He called it On the Way to the Chimney. That is literally the day that the clown died. Ugh. The day the clown cried. That is literally the plot That's of that movie. That's not literally the plot. The day the clown cried is he's trying to make the kids feel better. He's not murdering the children. I, think I don't you have know. A Either way, it's not a good You film. have a well, complete and total misunderstanding of what the plot of the day the clown cried is. It's just bad. It's well, just there bad is a lot. There is a lot that we don't know about the film. It has not been. And this is all the more horrifying knowing how little care Mangala actually used when performing experiments on children. He, uh, Almost never used anesthetic. Uh, he amputated limbs. He injected kids with typhus. He inflicted awful, awful wounds, all for comparative study to see how the body would react. <laughs> and the level of madness, only it only gets worse from here. It only increased from there. In one experiment, he interchanged the blood supply of two twins just to see what would happen. You know what happened? They died. In another, yep. he sewed two children together by their backs and wrists and observed just to see what would happen. They died of gangrene. And in the event that the twins didn't die together in experiments like, you know, the two that were sewed together had, the relatively healthy child would be killed by injecting chloroform straight into their heart, which caused almost instant heart failure. Mm. Miklos said that he witnessed Mangala personally kill 14 kids in one night Jesus. using this method. In fact, on Miklos's first day, he dissected eight Romani children under Mangala's direction because six out of the eight were twins that had different colored eyes from their partner twin. It was a heterochromia. And those eyes were removed and sent to Professor Otmar von Verschur at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin in a crate marked War Materials Urgent. And by the way, von Verschur skated completely on this whole fucking thing. Now, uh, how his entire relationship to Mangala completely skated, died a respected fucking scientist. That wow. guy, where if the, I mean, I don't know what I agree, of, I don't know what I think about what happens after you die, but these are the type of people that, like, for sure is in some form of hell. Like, they'd be, like something about that, too, because he just cleaned the the all any record of his relationship with Mengele after the war like he just made it so he was just like oh I don't know what happened and just covered his eyes right. like many people oh, that yeah. were uh, that lasted in Germany yeah. throughout World War II yeah von Verschur was the one who pushed Mengele into it, it was just like no you should go to Auschwitz wow. go on you, he was the one that pushed him he was the one and Mengele was constantly reporting back to him mm. and the eyes those are 
far from the only things that Mengele shipped out to universities, hospitals, museums, all around Germany. In one case, Mengele, during a selection, when they were all coming down the ramp, Mengele spotted a hunchback father with a son who had a deformed foot. So he took them, he gave them food, he examined them, and then just shot both of them in the back of the head. Then he had Dr. Miklos boil the bodies in iron casks so the flesh could be stripped from the bones. And then they sent the skeletons off to the Anthropological Museum in Berlin. But that's, that's, not, that's not even the worst part of that one. No, buddy. The worst part of that story was that the bodies had to be boiled for hours before the flesh would come off. So Miklos left them unattended. And when Miklos came back, he found a group of prisoners who had no idea what kind of meat was boiling, eating the boiled flesh with their hands. Okay. Um, oh so Tim Allen, now he got, <laughs> so the sweaters were actually from universities in Michigan. University of Michigan. In Michigan. Interesting. That's where they were from, the University oh of Michigan. Oh, my God. This is, yeah. this is honestly maybe the hardest episode we've ever done, or at least in... I don't know. That is it's, really uh, oh, it's that is really I mean, something I, horrible. The Toll Time audience was actually the live studio audience. Oh, is Whoa. that right? Oh, so that they actually makes sense. Isn't, see, I actually just knew turned that. around the camera. Oh, that makes just, sense. You know, I should have known that. They, uh, yeah, Henry, I that's why before, that. before <laughs> why uh, Home Improvement, would, me this <laughs> before home improvement would start, they would say filmed in front of a live <laughs> studio audience. And then wouldn't you believe it? I mean, that why was just the tool time Why audience. are they going to pay a whole new audience when well, they already got ugh, one there? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, the, the, the toilet that reclines. I mean, my God, that audience. That's the show within the show, as I've said multiple <laughs> times. And that's what I would be there for. That's this what I'd be there just, for. This is the, the biggest Gold Star episode we've ever done. And it's <sighs> just important for you to remember why, when we do next week's episode with the Nazi hunters, why we search for him so fucking hard and try to get him. And oh, then yeah. hopefully, if it's true, conspiracy theories are true, that the Mossad drowned him and then left him on the beach. But I don't know That's if spoiler, they did. Man. But it would nice it's a gigantic they did. spoiler. But, yeah, I'm sorry, it's a massive spoiler, but I might as well just start it now. Might as well just talk about remember that we're, we're hunting these fuckers next That's episode. That's right. Yep. Next next episode, it's going to be a, a nice release from mm -hmm. All of the rage and uh, and uh, pain you feel right now. Well, as far as Mangala's attitude towards all this went, it was all just a part of the job. And it was a job that he absolutely uh, adored. Now, once, uh, Miklos, he'd gotten a smudge of grease on a file. And he said that Mangala just gave him this withering glance and very, very seriously said, quote, how can you be so careless with these files, which I have compiled with so much love? With so much love. Oh, that was his exact God. words, with so much love. Now, twins, they weren't the only ones who were the subject of Mangala's experiments. One experiment involved eight women and a device that one witness described as, quote, electrical machinery, the likes of which I had never seen. The witness never saw what Mangala actually did because the witness got the fuck out of the room as soon as Mangala entered because that's kind of what happened. Every time Mangala would enter a room, everyone was terrified of him, yeah. so they would all find an excuse to leave as soon as they could. But this witness said that after a lot of screaming, two of the eight women were dead, five were in a coma, and one was convulsing, strapped to a cot. And there was Mangala discussing the results casually with another doctor, the whole thing was done uh, in the pursuit of testing endurance just to see how far they could take the human body. Which we saw in Unit 731, yeah. which we covered in an episode not too long ago. They did this kind of thing, too. But it's something about the, also the personalities attached to this, where Mengele was just so pleased yeah, just with having his a, work all the time. Having a he casual... was so into it. Everybody else was uh, horrified at their hands of it, but he was there just being like, excellent. The other thing that I want, we didn't bring up was what that room looked like, which also sounded fucking terrifying, that it was a red concrete room that you go into. It had a red floor and red walls with white, with these poor, the big marble slab in the middle of it and these white porcelain things. So it looked like a fucking, it looked like Suspiria. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. And then just having a cordial conversation in the middle of it. Yeah. And these endurance tests, <sighs> he even extended these to babies. I mean, Mangala once covered a mother's breast with tape to see how long the baby could live without food. But the mother, Mercy, killed the child 
rather than give Mangala the satisfaction and signing her own <sighs> death warrant as well. And other times, like, there are some of these things like I, it just, it can't, it, I, I can't believe it. Like the, they said that he stood on pregnant women's stomachs until the fetuses were expelled and is even said to have dissected a one-year-old infant while the child was still alive. Like Ugh. it doesn't. But, and there's shit that, I mean, like there's shit that, like, it's not that it's well, exaggerated, but there's shit that like you could look at some of the, the, those types of experiments that you're just like, I don't know if he did it, but I will say that if he felt that it could get his tongue deeper up Himmler's asshole, he would have done it. Yeah. So I don't put anything past Oh, I'm not going to give Mengele the benefit of the doubt on anything. No. no I, I, Definitely not. But in the middle of all this, as he was literally killing babies and needlessly amputating the limbs of children and cutting off the breasts of female prisoners for experimental materials, his wife came for a visit. Really, his wife came for a visit. <laughs> but like the idea of being like, oh. she was like, I miss you, because that's what she was saying, because he'd been gone for so long, he went out there, you can't get in contact, and he was like, off, you off, you should be you should come by the office, and meet me at the office, and then so she comes all the way out to Auschwitz, we're talking about like days of a trip, mm -hmm. and then uh, at least according to Irene Mengele, she was like, what the fuck is this? She like walked in. And uh, you walk into Auschwitz. You were gonna go visit your fucking husband, and then you're like, "Oh, this is what you're. This is what you're doing." And she still was a hardline Nazi, so she protected. But at least it cracked the veneer a little <sighs> bit. Yeah, but she also said that the three weeks that she spent at three Auschwitz, weeks, <laughs> three weeks, three weeks. <laughs> that is a hell of a fucking vacation. Uh, that is way, way overstayed. She said they were happy and peaceful because so she's I mean, complicit but, but, yeah, in all of this. I mean, part oh, of it yeah, of course, was, yeah. No, she was, and we'll find out later on too. She was extremely complicit because they helped him fucking get away. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and because part of what she loved about it is that Mengele had a couple of personal slaves. He had Jehovah's Witnesses as slaves because Jehovah's Witnesses also went to the concentration camps because of their vow of nonviolence, and that's also why Jehovah's Witnesses a lot of times were used as uh, household servants. Uh, and went for SS officers. Mm. Uh, yeah, they did all sorts of like vacation stuff. They went and swam in the river. They went and picked Jesus. wild blackberries. She made jam. Really? She did? Yeah, claimed that she had no clue uh -huh. that Auschwitz was anything more than a prison camp, despite the constant, uh, what she called sweet stench that permeated everything. I would believe if Jeffrey Dahmer had a roommate in his apartment, I would believe that he had less of an idea of what <laughs> yes. was going on. Like uh, the whole thing is you know evidence what of what's going you're on. You're making sauce. You're making some kind of sausage stew here. What is? Oh, these are the funniest looking sausages I've ever, I've ever seen. Wait a second, are these? Are these penises? <laughs> It is so abhorrent that she is like three weeks on vacation there yeah. and even pretending like she doesn't know what the hell is going on. Well, according to her, Mangala, uh, charming, funny, sociable. She called him her first great love. Even after knowing about all this, still called him her first great love. She said his only flaw was that he was vain because he was a little too obsessed with his height. He thought he was too short. Yeah, like that Carly Simon song. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. But that's the thing, though, is that as we'll later see in the next episode... That vanity would save his life. <sighs> now, although Mengele's actions were cruel in the extreme in just his day-to-day -day work, he was even worse when he lost his temper. In one fit of fury, he took the newborn child of a Russian woman, grabbed it by the head, and just threw it into a pile of corpses and said, leave it there. Another time, he took a newborn baby from a woman who managed to sneak her pregnancy into the camp unnoticed because if you were pregnant, you were supposed to go to the gas chambers. And he was so angry that his subordinates had missed the pregnant woman that he took the newborn baby and threw it into a burning stove. God. And another time, he was so angry that a work detail had allowed prisoners who were chosen to die uh, to, jo to join those fit for work. It was just kind of a little goof up. Oh, those people are supposed to go to the gas chambers. Why are they here with the workers? Why the fuck are they here with the workers? So Mingala took out his own pistol and shot each person in the head one by one, shot each prisoner in the head one by one, just to fucking show them. But perhaps the absolute worst thing that Mengele directed involved a group of 300 children who had arrived in Auschwitz from either a kindergarten 
or an orphanage in Russia. And this right here is almost beyond belief. This is one of the worst things I've ever heard. It's so cruel and so strange that it doesn't sound real. But several people witnessed these events actually happen. So Mingala and a large group of SS officers arrived on motorcycles that day to a large fire pit burning in one of the Auschwitz yards. The men got off their bikes, circled the pit, and waited. Eventually, ten dump trucks arrived, each one full of children. An order was given, and one by one, the trucks backed up to the pit and SS officers began tossing children into the open flame. Some children even managed to crawl out half alive, but those were pushed back in by an SS officer who was armed with nothing more than than a long stick. Not a single victim was over the age of five. Ugh. You know what? It's almost like I'd rather, it's almost like I need like a full house <laughs> piece of trivia. Like I need like almost yeah. even something else besides home improvement. Oh my God. To All do right. it, you know? In Germany, home improvement is called Hormal Verdehammert. You know, I don't even care about the Germans right now. <laughs> I don't even want them to ever have home improvement. But, they didn't deserve home improvement. But what, what does it, means, it stand for? It, it means, listen to who's hammering. I the hate that name. The name of name. home improvement <laughs> in Germany is listen to who's hammering. Why are they so listen German? To Can they just take hammering. a break from being so German all the time? Just, Honestly. Come on. Listen to who's hammering. That's the name like of the show? Like, you, if you're hearing hammering, you're hearing it. So it's like it's coming. You can't even actively not oh. listen to who's hammering because it's oh. happening and you're hearing hammering. Well, it's. Uh, do we know what tool time was called on the show inside the show? <laughs> oh my god! It's like this is devastating. <sighs> but when Mangala was evaluated by his garrison commander in August of uh, 1944, um, the report described Mangala's mental state as quote. Outstanding. Oh my of course. god. Yeah, further the praise by saying that Mengele had the impeccable demeanor of an SS officer while his character made him a favorite around camp. Uh, isn't that nice? Isn't that something? Nah, but, wow. But this report came just a few months before Nazi Germany and therefore Auschwitz came to an end. As the Russians closed in, it was said that some Nazis at Auschwitz actually became more pleasant. Trying to, uh, any way they could, just yep. trying yeah. to escape judgment. They became more pleasant to the prisoners. They became uh, more yeah. helpful. Trying oh, to yeah. escape judgment, ho hoping that maybe when the Russians came, the prisoner would say, like, well, that one isn't so bad. Don't kill him. Oh, buddy, I don't know if they're going to be that sympathetic. Yeah. Uh, as a yeah, matter buddy. of fact, I know for a fact that they won't be. Yeah, but others actually became more brutal as the Russians got nearer. Uh, one doctor who was there was quoted as saying that these types of men... When the Russians were closing in and they knew that it was over, not only was Auschwitz over, but Nazi Germany was over, everything was over, at that moment, it was more necessary than ever to believe that they were right. Oh, God. Uh, and, you know, and as far as Mengele went, when they were talking about, they were... Uh his wife said he became depressed. Mm -hmm. And at first they were like, well, he was mad and upset because he felt that all of his research would go to waste. But then I don't think that that is true at all. I believe that he got depressed because he knew he was about to get fucking hung or b or what should have happened is that he should have been gotten by the Russians and he should have been forced to deal with the Russian work prisons. And his I feel like that 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 would is where that and he knew that it was coming. His work is trash. Mm -hmm. So his work is trash. It's literally trash. garbage. And he continued for as long as possible. I mean, he even at his last experiment, and he kill, continued killing people. Like, uh, his last experiment was about a month and a half before the camp was liberated. Just killed 11 female dwarves. We don't even know what the experiment was about. No idea. No idea what the aim was. We just know that 11, de 11 were killed. Uh, and uh, in his last days at Auschwitz, I mean, he created a fake pile of research notes because he knew full well that what he'd been doing all along was holy and completely criminal in every way imaginable. Yeah. And he wanted something to point towards when that when they got there. I was like, no, look, that's that's my research. I didn't do all that other stuff because all that other stuff, right. all those other notes, those were all sent to Professor Otmar Freiherr von Verschur look at, at the all Kaiser that Wilhelm Institute. Look at all that paper. Yeah, I have so <laughs> much paper. And then he got erased. No and then that is the but he got erased too. 
knew. That was a part of the way that they tried to distance themselves from the crimes that they allowed to per- perpetrate and actually ordered him to do. So he got the, the, they tried to erase every, every bit of evidence of the crimes and also what happened at Auschwitz. And it's, uh, it's, it's a shame that we now, but we knew because at least witnesses came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Vaughn for sure, like he kept Mengele's notes until the sixties. Wow. And then burn them in a bonfire. This is why I have this eternal question, and I'd like it because obviously I'm only barely. I can hear, the more I read about it, the less I understand. And we're doing our best to to go through his crimes piece by piece and talking about them. But my my question for historians, if there's anybody out there that knows far more than me, of obviously, uh, like if the Nazis felt that they were right, why did they want to erase? The evidence, like if they really felt that they were correct and that they were waiting to be the ones that were in control, in control of the entire world, then why they then immediately they must have somewhere inside knew that they were being criminals, but they were pushing this agenda for so long. Well, it, it was that they knew that they were they knew that other people thought of them as criminals. They didn't see themselves as criminals, and they didn't see what they, they were why doing. Why weren't they proud of their shitty results? Why weren't they so proud of, of everything that they did? Because they knew that how they got there, they would be punished for that. They knew that other people didn't want that. They knew that they were forcing their will upon others. I mean, there's a reason why the movie was called Triumph of the Will, because they uh, were imposing this upon others. It's for their own good. They don't know that this is what's best. They don't know this is what they uh, actually want. I mean, it's like it's dictatorship. Complete uh, it's complete. It's fascism. It's all kinds of bullshit. It's like, this is what's best for them. But uh, uh, but if they fight back and if they don't, if, yeah. if they catch me doing this type of shit and if they get into power, uh, they, they're going to get all weird about it. It. It's complete cowardice as well. <laughs> yeah, it's just total cowardice. And as soon as you know, like with any bully, yeah, you know, as yeah. soon as the flip, well, as soon as, as, soon as, you, as, yeah, as, soon as you flip, approach it, just, yeah. yeah. Well, that's why how many comedians were killed because a Hitler had a directive, basically saying that they couldn't stand being made fun of. They were so vain and so uh, they had such a superiority complex that they couldn't handle with anybody. They couldn't handle any, of any sort of anti rhetoric, anything that could possibly show that they were in the wrong because their logic was so fucking flawed. And tainted and light. It was so, oh it was God, so yeah. easily disposed of. Totally. So you could pop their logic with a pin and they knew it. And that was the job. I mean, obviously, everyone or, you know, the vast majority of people suffered under the, uh, the Nazis. And that's why we have to always remember, uh, that, you know, comedians and truth tellers or whatever, like that's why they're important. Mm-hmm. Even if you disagree with like whatever, but you, you, we just can't lose sight of that. Well, according to Dr. Miklos, Mengele's last orders were to destroy Auschwitz completely. Two crematoriums were demolished while they were told to say that the third was used exclusively for natural deaths. Like, yeah, just keep the third one there, but, you know, let's destroy the other two. And the fourth uh, had thankfully already been destroyed the previous October in uh, a Sunder Commando revolt that had resulted in the deaths of 70 SS officers. Cool. It's a crazy story. It's a crazy it is a story. crazy story. The way they talk about how, like, because they would have uh, a certain group of women were working inside of one of the munitions factories, and they would hide little bits of uh, gunpowder in pieces of paper, and they would smuggle them out bit by bit to the people within the Sonder Commando that were trying to do a, a, a do the uprising. And they they got enough over the years of working in the factory to blow up one of the crematoriums. It's a very intense. Mm-hmm. Now, Mengele and all the rest of the Nazis fled Auschwitz on January 17th, 1945, and the camp was officially liberated by the Red Army on January 27th. Exactly, and we didn't plan this at all, Mm, exactly 74 years ago to this day. This is Holocaust Remembrance Day. We did not plan this. This Mm, just sort of happened that we ended up... Recording this episode at the yeah. same time. It just kind of happened that way. Yeah, and we were not, I mean, we got pushed too. Yeah, it's we got this whole pushed. thing. We were supposed to record this last week. It's very intense. Um, well, while many in charge of the slaughter at Auschwitz were caught, including the commandant who ran the place, uh, a lot of them escaped, including Mangala. But he, like all the others, spent the rest of their lives running. And that's how this series will end next week with chasing down that sadistic fuck along with all the rest of his shithead brethren in Joseph Mengele Part 3, 
The Nazi Hunters. Nazi Gotta Hunters. Get those fucking pieces of shit. Enough of them got got. And ooh, man, oh, man, oh, well, man. No. Yeah, Is it well. nice to finally switch yeah. to start reading about Nazi Hunters? Yeah. Well, the, because now that I've been reading about that, it does make me feel a lot better. Because these well, are the people, a lot of people did not sleep and made sure that Mengele did not sleep a night of restful rest again for the rest of his life. Yeah. And a huge, gigantic special thanks to research assistant Rachel uh, for her help on this episode. Thank She's you, great. Rachel. Uh, Helping out with uh, the uh, book by Dr. Miklos Nizli. Awesome. All right. Next week, we'll get the uh, get all the frustration out. Nazi hunters. Um, it's going to be. I'm I'm excited to see some some vengeance. Honestly, and you understand the rage and the hatred and the anger towards uh, the German people and the Nazi Party uh, at the end it, of World War II when all of this stuff came out. And we'll talk about the basically decade long uh, allowance of just do what you want. Yeah. To the Nazis. Yes. And it. This is. It's obviously a very intense story, and it is, it is a lot of horrible, grisly details, but I think a part of that is facing it. It's facing these facts. I think that people have been talking about uh, these crimes for many, many years in different aspects, and we, we for us, it was more of like trying to understand Dr. Mengele, because yeah. I think that we talk a lot of times, like when we did Rasputin, or we do certain series where it's like, you hear about somebody. You hear about the legend of the angel of death. You hear about Dr. Mengele and what he was. And a part of it is you, you end up putting yourself into Auschwitz, reading about it. And, and I, I, I hope that I can learn something from this shit or you can learn something from this shit about like, this is a hug your dog episode. Mm -hmm. This is like a remember that we're all human beings in this together episode and that this kind of shit can't happen again. And that the, the but it did happen. Oh, and, absolutely. And, it, and it's a stain on our species because it happened. And then all we can do is hope to live lives as much as you can that fucking rights these wrongs everywhere you go. Yeah. And especially nowadays with all this misinformation, disinformation, all these ridiculous YouTube holes you can go on. Mm. It's real. The Holocaust happened. Exactly. This is 100% fact. There is nothing. We're not. Some, you know, disinfo agents. This is fucking real. Yeah. And so and we got to so remember much... that. And also, Henry, I want to correct you. It's Rasputin. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's <laughs> Rasputin. <laughs> All right. We also have a couple of live shows coming up that we can finally start announcing. A lot of live Fuck shows. Yeah. Um, Actually. And we cannot wait to see everyone once again on the road. Uh, last year was so exciting. Don't forget, you can watch our special from last year, www.lastpodcastlive.com. It's still fresh and it's still fun. So check that out. $6.66. So uh, some... Some of the first shows we're announcing for 2019. We are thrilled in on Tuesday, March 19th. We'll be in Nashville at Poke Theater. Uh, cannot wait to go to Nashville once again. Uh, Wednesday, March 20th, we'll be in Cincinnati at the Taft Theater. And we mentioned, we mentioned Taft's oh, party yeah, today. That's right. Yeah, big boys. Yeah, yeah. we can see Panzeram. <laughs> that's where Panzeram was. Uh, Friday, March 22nd, we're going to be in beautiful Cleveland at the Masonic Auditorium. I love Cleveland. I'm we really excited to go back to Cleveland. Can can't wait. And Saturday, we are absolutely thrilled. March 23rd, we're going back to one of our favorite cities, Pittsburgh. At My Bi baby's hometown. Yes, at Buy Ham Theater. Or Buy, Bi 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 Theater. Buy Bi Ham? Uh, Bi buy some Hell ham. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so those are the dates. And Patreon, you'll be able to get access to those dates on Monday of this week. And, and that's the, Monday, January 28th. Yep. And then the following Wednesday, they will be available for all to purchase. So we cannot wait to see you guys. Yes. Uh, very excited to get back on the road. Uh, we uh, Again, we want to thank everybody for the support that they've given us in this uh, very intense time period that we've been in. Um, it means a lot to oh, see yeah. how far the community goes and how many people are uh, super supportive of the uh, the community here at Last Podcast Network, mm -hmm. and it means the whole fucking world uh, because th th we do as much as we can to make you guys laugh and be informed, and it's really nice when you guys can be there for us. Absolutely. Rest in peace, Kevin Barnett, Bird Luger. Um, if you have any memories of Kevin that you would like to share with us, the Facebook page, uh, which we have not plugged Facebook in quite a while, <laughs> but if you no, go to the yeah, round... We are, we are still not even a part of that Facebook um, page, so it's... But if you go to the roundtable page, or you can email us at the last podcast network at gmail.com. If you want to listen to some old roundtable episodes, send us a, a favorite clip or something of Kevin Barnett. Uh, I think we're going to try to put together a little best of here. Um, you know, it, it'll take a little bit of time, but uh, so feel free to do that. We'll definitely uh, take your uh, take your thoughts into consideration because honestly, you all the the memories that you have all shared on social media about Kev 
you know, because we've been we have it's been years uh, yeah. of working. So it, yes. it was so it's just great to hear your thoughts. And uh, again, we love you, Kevin. And uh, hug hug your friends and remind them that you love them because you never know. So thank you all so much for being part of our last podcast family. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh, um, all right, everyone. thank you so much. Hail Satan! Hail yourselves! Hugging. Hail me! And let's do one. The end. Magustalations? Yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah. I've heard that. I feel like we. I. I think that we own that name. It's right? the name of our company, Henry. Oh, good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we have one. Oh, good. <laughs>